all set for the jury this morning? Well, you can go ahead and bring it up. <laughs> Please rise, Jory Ensign. Please be seated. State call Steve Ostrowski. All right, good morning, sir. Good morning. So once you come into the witness stand, I'd ask you to remain standing. Kindly raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give to the jury will be the truth and the whole truth under the penalties of perjury? I do. Please be seated. And if you can please introduce yourself to the jurors. Yes, my name is Stephen Ostrowski. And where do you work? I work for the New Hampshire Department of Safety State Police Forensic Laboratory in Concord. And for about how long have you worked for the state lab? About? Almost 25 years now. And what is your present assignment at the lab? I am currently a criminalist three uh, supervising the pattern evidence unit. And what do you mean by criminalist three? Uh, there's different levels of criminalist. Uh, a, a criminalist one is uh, a forensic scientist that does casework primarily. A criminalist two has additional duties of, of training and reviewing other people's work. And then on top of that, a criminalist three has supervisory duties, which uh, what I do. And again, what unit do you work for in the state lab? It's the pattern evidence unit, which, which um, relates to fingerprints and footwear and tire impressions. And are those the types of analyses that you conduct at the state lab? Uh, yes, it is. Can you go over your training and experience, focus on the uh, analysis of latent impressions? Yes, so after I uh, earned my master's degree in forensic science from the University of New Haven down in Connecticut, uh, I began working at the lab in 1999. Uh, and from that point, I had a, a one-year extensive in-house training program under three senior fingerprint examiners with 30 plus years experience. Uh, so after I got done training, um, I tested out and was authorized to do independent casework. Uh, and part of, the, part of the training included uh, reading numerous uh, professional journal articles and textbooks on the areas of fingerprints, uh, attaining, I attended three uh, FBI uh, courses on, on fingerprints. I attended uh, specialized courses on, on fingerprints, palm prints, and, and difficult complex impressions out, out of state. Uh, I attended numerous conferences and meetings, uh, even um, uh, presenting eventually at some of those meetings and, and writing articles that are published in journals. Uh, and to date, I've worked about 2,000 different fingerprint cases. And I think I got a little bit ahead of myself. I've been referring to latent impressions. You've talked about fingerprints. If you can explain what a latent impression is for the jury and how that compares to a, a fingerprint. Right. Uh, a latent print is a type of fingerprint. A latent print is something that occurs when, when we touch objects. So I could, I could touch this surface right here and leave a, a, a latent fingerprint. The term latent means hidden, so it's difficult to see at first, and it usually requires some type of enhancement, whether through powders or chemicals or special photography, to, to see those prints and document them. And for about how long have you been conducting latent impression examinations? About? Uh, about 24 years. And you are certified as a latent print examiner? Yes, I am. And through what body are you certified, and what does that certification entail? Uh, I'm certified by the International Association for Identification, or the IAI, which is one of the largest forensic uh, organizations in the entire world. Um, uh, the requirements to be certified is you have to, to go through training and then have several years of, of casework experience before you could even apply. So once you apply, uh, you sit for a knowledge test, so it's a three-part knowledge test, and if you pass that test, then you're sent a separate test, uh, which is a practical test where you actually have to compare fingerprints 
um, and you have to send that back to the organizing body and they, and they correct it. And you have to get, I think, a minimum of, of 12 prints correct and you can't make any errors, otherwise you fail the test. Uh, and from that point, I was certified, I think, in 2003. And in every, every five years after that, I have to retest to remain, to, to recertify, to maintain my certification. In addition to your training, your experience, your certification, and in, also in addition to conducting your own latent impression examinations, you also review analyses conducted by other examiners for accuracy. Yes, as part of my job is to review other people's work, yes. Have you testified before in courts of law as an expert in latent impression analysis? Uh, yes, I have. Throughout the state, I've testified uh, between 30 and 35 times just regarding latent prints. Judge, at this time, the state does offer Mr. Ostrowski as an expert in latent impression analysis. <coughs> Is there any objection? Yeah. He'll be so qualified. So how can a latent impression be created and left behind on an object? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, when, you, when we touch things with our, with our hands, uh, we, have, we have residues on our hands, and our hands are made up of a special kind of skin called friction ridge skin. Uh, so the fingerprint, there's uh, residues and sweat and uh, foreign contaminants on our hands, and when we touch things, we leave those impressions or replications of the skin behind. Uh, so those types of prints could be developed uh, and used in forensic cases. Let's talk about some misconceptions that may, people may have from watching TV or the movies regarding overall regarding latent impressions such as fingerprints. If I touch an item such as I'm touching this podium right now, does that mean that my fingerprints are necessarily going to be left behind on this item? Not necessarily. There's lots of times where we touch items and don't leave uh, a good fingerprint behind. We might leave fragments of a fingerprint or just residues, uh, but no, it's not necessarily guaranteed that when you touch an item, you leave a good fingerprint behind. Are uh, you familiar with the term chance impression? Yes. And, and what does that mean? Uh, it's another name for latent impression. So latent impression is, uh, like I said, a, a impression that we leave behind, but uh, they're also known as by different names and chance impression or, or a question or crime scene print or other names for it as well. Going back to my example, I'm touching the podium. Uh, will a latent impression, such a fingerprint left behind uh, on that object, will it always remain on the item? Uh, no. Uh, it, it, fingerprints or latent prints in general are very delicate, so they need to um, uh, be handled properly and be in a proper environment, and, and things could affect them. They could be wiped off. They could, they could uh, dehydrate and kind of disappear or, or degrade over time. So it doesn't guarantee, just because I touch something doesn't mean my fingerprint's going to remain on it for a long time. Uh, because of the many various factors that impact first whether a, a, an impression will be left behind and how long it stays, is it fair to say that uh, many different role, many different factors play a role in this? Yes, yes, lots of factors of, of leaving prints behind and lots of factors of the print actually staying on an object and factors of, of developing it in the lab or in a crime scene type situation go into you obtaining and using uh, usable fingerprints in a, in a case. Can recovered latent impressions be used for identification purposes? Yes. Uh, we will talk about this more a little bit, uh, but even for a particular latent impression, say a fingerprint, and it's found on an object, does that mean that the impression is actually suitable for comparison and potential identification purposes? Uh, not necessarily. There's, there's a, a wide range of, of quality uh, and quantity of fingerprints that are, that are left behind. So uh, oftentimes there are just fragments of a fingerprint, or sometimes there's many overlays of things that are commonly touched. Think of a doorknob to uh, uh, an office building. Many people may, may touch that doorknob, but, but they may be ruining the fingerprint. All those overlays may make it unusable, any kind of developed prints on there. So there's lots of factors that go into that. I'm going to be talking more about your analysis of uh, latent impressions later on. I want to tur uh, turn to some of the specific work that you performed in this case. Did you attend the autopsies of Jenna Pellegrini and Christine Sullivan on January 31st of 2017? Yes, I did. And for what purpose did you attend their autopsies? Uh, I had two purposes that day. So uh, the first purpose was to examine the bodies and the condition of the bodies and any kind of associated 
materials that were with the bodies to determine if any uh, question impressions left in, in blood might be present and to document those impressions. Uh, and the second objective was to um, record the known finger and palm prints of, of those two individuals. With respect to looking for impressions that may have been left behind on blood, are those latent prints or are those called something different? Uh, they're called, so it, something that's left in a material like blood that you could actually see pretty decently, that's called a patent print. Uh, if it was very difficult to see or almost invisible, that would be a latent print, but essentially they're close to the same thing. Did you find any impressions suitable for comparison purposes either on the victim's bodies or their clothing or any of the materials that their bodies were wrapped in? I did not. You said that the second purpose of you attending the autopsies was to actually obtain fingerprint exemplars from both Ms. Sullivan and Ms. Pellegrini? That's correct. And for what purpose? Uh, that was to uh, record their prints for purposes of comparing it to any other latent prints that were developed in this case. Also, as part of the work that you conducted in this case, did you process the house located at 979 Meterborough Road for possible impressions? I did, yes. And were you the only criminalist from the state lab who conducted impression processing at the house itself? Yes. What were among the areas and items at the house that you remember processing for potential impressions? Uh, that day we were directed to specific areas within the house to, to assist with the crime scene processing. So uh, I probably processed areas uh, of the, in the kitchen. I processed the, the right side of the refrigerator as well as the slider door and door frame leading onto the porch, um, uh, light switches on either side of that slider door. Uh, there was an additional slider door off of that porch on, onto like a, um, a, an outside porch or a deck. So I processed that uh, slider door and frame uh, as well as um, a headboard in one of the guest bedrooms and then downstairs we processed items in the uh, washroom area. So there was like the washer dryer and a sink. Uh, there was a utility box, like an electrical utility cable box, as well as a toolbox in the adjoining uh, uh, workshop. Were any identifiable impressions recovered from inside the residence in the areas or the items that you examined in the residence? No. So let's switch gears from processing items for possible uh, impressions to the analysis of recovered latent impressions and did you conduct such an analysis in this case? I did, yes. Did you recover the impressions that you analyzed or did somebody else recover those impressions? Someone else recovered them. And uh, who recovered them, who did that processing? Was that criminalist Rice who's testifying next? Yes, criminalist Emily Rice at the lab. So on the screen <coughs> is State's Exhibit 43, and two of the items in this exhibit have been highlighted in red. We have GMH 15, which the jurors heard from before, a black trash bag, and we also have TLE 69, which the jurors heard before, an ice melter container. Are those two items that you analyzed recovered latent impressions from? Yes. And to be clear, you did not, reco uh, you did not analyze any recovered impressions from this clear trash bag, TLE 55, or any of its contents, right? No, I did not. The items that you did analyze are on this next slide. How many latent impressions from GMH 15 and TLE 69 did you examine? Uh, one latent impression from each item. So we're going to discuss the results of your analyst, uh, analysis shortly. Before doing that, let's discuss how you go about examining an item for latent impressions and how you go about comparing impressions and potentially making identifications. And to help with that, did you prepare a presentation for us? I did. So with that, I will give you the clicker. We've had some issues with it, so hopefully the slides will advance. If they don't, I will take it and you can tell me when to advance.
Please. Okay. Uh, so this, um, this slide shows friction-rich skin, which I mentioned earlier. So friction-rich skin is found on the palmar sides of our hands and the soles of our feet, so our feet and toes and our fingers and, and palms uh, all have this skin. And this is a picture of, of a thumb with a little bit of, of powder on it being pressed on glass to, to, to accentuate some of the... Uh, uh, the parts of friction-rich skin, and, and the purpose of friction-rich skin is so we can grasp items, so we don't, so we have a good hold on them, so they don't slip through our hands. So that's the purpose of of this type of skin. But um, I'll talk further about it on the, on the next slides. Uh, so as we zoom in, uh, I want to point out just a couple points about what friction skin is comprised of. Uh, it's comprised of uh, ridges, which are the high areas, uh, which are kind of like the peaks. And then the areas between the ridges are called furrows. Those are the valleys. And then uh, on the ridges themselves are small little areas of uh, sweat pores. So each of those circles is a separate sweat pore, uh, which are very numerous on our, on our hands and our feet. Uh, then, and those are small details that could also show up in latent impressions as well, those small little sweat pores. And Talking about the, 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 as we zoom in, there's different levels of detail that we look at in a fingerprint. So uh, level one is the ridge path or flow. And that was the very first picture I showed you, like an over, overview of the entire thumb. Uh, that's what le level one is. We can categorize that into patterns, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, level two is the actual path that each of those ridges take, uh, its unique path and how it reacts with its neighboring ridges. And then level three are those very small details uh, that go in, that, such as the sweat pores and, and the edges that we'll talk about on, on subsequent slides. Uh, so here's level one. Level one, the first thing we're, we look at with fingerprints is, is level one, so a bird's eye view. Um, uh, whether it's a fingerprint or a palm print, we, we look at the overall ridge flow and, and the different formations that it makes. So it helps us to classify and zero in on certain areas of a finger or a palm or a toe. And this is just showing the three different types of fingerprint patterns that are available. Uh, the entire population of the world all fingerprints could be, be in one of these categories, so they're shared by a wide variety of people, so it's just a, a, a broad category. Uh, and identifications can't be made at this level of detail. It would have to be the next level when we zoom in, that's where we make the actual uh, identifications to people, because these are very common. So at level two, we look at these different uh, formations to um, do our comparisons. So we look at bifurcations, that's where uh, a ridge splits into two different ridges. So that's a, a formation that's very important. Another one is called a ridge ending. Uh, sometimes ridges abruptly stop and then the neighboring ridges will, will fill in the area and, and keep flowing into the pattern. And the third one is called a dot, sometimes a short ridge uh, that's kind of uh, sandwiched in between more mature ridges and, and that's, you know, that's how it, uh, during the fetal formation process, that's how it ended its growth period and then it, it kind of stopped. So uh, those are the, these are the areas that we uh, zero in on when doing comparisons. Uh, and if we have enough of these, uh, the next uh, picture shows a bunch more in a, in a regular fingerprint as opposed to like a cartoon, but uh, we're looking at those same formations um, when we're making our comparisons, trying to get to either an identification or an exclusion uh, to an individual. And that third level of detail, really zooming in, uh, they could, these details, if they're present, because um, they're, they're very small and sometimes distortion uh, overtakes them, but these could also support an identification as well. So if, if the fingerprint is clear enough, you know, high enough quality and quantity of, of information, uh, these things such as sweat pores and the very edges of those ridges uh, and some of the shapes that, that come about can be used for identification purposes as well. And this is just a visual of what those might look like. So when we zoom way in on a fingerprint, some of these obscurities or, or formations uh, could be seen in both a latent impression and a known exemplar and be used to come to a conclusion of identification. 
And this next slide talks about how uh, friction rich skin uh, and how we produce latent prints. So I talked about that a few times already. So on our hands, we're, gonna, we're constantly sweating, we're touching our face, so the oils and, and things that come out of different areas of our face or just other contaminants, whether it's dirt or grease, get onto our hands, and then we touch items and leave impressions behind. Uh, so that, uh, that combination of, of sweat and other materials, fats and oils and foreign contaminants form what's called fingerprint residue. So that's the residue that's on all of our hands. So when we touch things, we're leaving fingerprints. Uh, and those could be developed and, and documented in, a, in an investigation. So latent impressions uh, can be um, developed using different means. They could be developed using chemicals. They could be developed using powders or special forensic lighting sources to, to make them fluoresce. Uh, and then we would take pictures or lists of those to memorialize them and keep them uh, documented in a forensic case. And there's lots of factors that go into leaving uh, an impression. Uh, this uh, schematic just shows how a finger would come down and touch the surface uh, and, and transfer that residue onto the surface. Uh, so any type of very hard pressure or lateral movement or, or twisting may lead to distortion. Uh, so quite often, fingerprints, fingers and palms could leave marks on objects and those marks could be smudged, uh, but we need to look for the fingerprints that are left that are, have high quality of, of detail left behind so we can actually see the details to make a comparison. And this is just what typical latent impressions look like in a case. Uh, they're partials. Sometimes you can't tell what part of the hand it's from. Uh, sometimes there's limitations in um, due to the, the, the surface that it was recovered from or the, the um, and you can see the different pressures that lead to distortions and smearing. Uh, so it's uh, not always easy to find a really pretty looking uh, fingerprint to work with. And we would take those latent impressions and compare them to standards. So they're, they could be called record, uh, record impressions or exemplars. These are known recordings of certain individuals. So we would compare a latent impression, which is an unknown question impression from a scene or from a piece of evidence, and compare it to a known impression or recording from a person to see if, if both of those prints were made by the same source. And, and actually, if I can stop you here, the jurors heard from another witness yesterday about major case prints. Are these major case prints? Uh, these would be a portion of major case prints, so these What's, what's on the screen here is called temperance, so this is like one impression of every finger, but major case imprints would also entail uh, the, the lower joints of the fingers as well as the palm, uh, fingertips, uh, so that's just a, a piece of what's called major case impressions that, are, that aren't done routinely for your everyday crimes, but for uh, major cases, they, they try to record as much detail as possible uh, from individuals. And these can be recorded either using traditional ink or, or quite often now there's digital means to capture them, which is called live scan. It's a kiosk where you could just uh, uh, record the fingers or the palms on, on just glass with a little laser underneath it and just records pictures of, of the impressions. And the basic principle, principles behind the comparison of latent prints to uh, known exemplars to come to a conclusion is based on two basic principles. Uh, it's based on the uniqueness of the formations of fr friction-rich skin as well as the permanence. Uh, so friction-rich skin is highly variable from person to person. Even identical twins who share the same DNA have different formations of, of finger, uh, friction ridges on their, on their fingers and their palms. Uh, and those arrangements have been shown scientifically to be persistent throughout one's life. So um, it won't change, it'll, it'll grow. So as a child grows, your hands get bigger, but the formations stay in the same pattern. Uh, unless there's some sort of damage from an accident or, or a disease that would cause scarring, um, that pattern is going to remain persistent throughout an individual's life. 
And the methodology that we use when we're comparing these sprints, we call the ACE methodology, and it stands for analysis, comparison, and evaluation. Uh, the first step analysis is information gathering. So we're studying the latent impression very closely. We're looking at, at the uh, levels of, character, of features that are in there, the bifurcations and the ending ridges. We're, we're plotting those out. Uh, we're analyzing any type of distortion that might be there. Uh, to be careful in those areas. And then once that's completed, we're going to analyze the, the record impression for the same things. And then we're going to do a comparison between those. So the next phase comparison is, is the searching of those fingerprint cards and those major case impressions of different people. Uh, and then when you're zeroing in on one particular print and that has um, that has the same levels one and levels two details, you're going to come to the last step, which is the evaluation step, where you have to decide uh, your conclusion, whether it's going to be exclusion, identification, or inconclusive. Those are the three possibilities when you do fingerprint comparisons. And when we make an identification of someone, this is what it means. It means that there's a sufficient amount of quality and quantity of friction ridge detail in that latent impression that it's also seen in the record impression to, come to, to be able to say that they both came from the same source. So the latent print and the record print were made by the same finger or the same palm. And, and we know who that is based on the official record of the person, uh, uh, you know, a certain person that's signed that card and was part of that process of recording the exemplar. So let's go back to the actual analysis that you conducted in this case. You examined one latent impression recovered from criminalist rice from GMH 15, and also one latent impression recovered from criminalist rice from TLE 69? That's correct. Did you compare those two recovered impressions to known impressions from Timothy Verrill? Yes, I did. And let's turn to your findings, and let's begin with your findings of the latent impression recovered from GMH 15, the black trash bag here on the left. And on the screen is States Exhibit 66, and if you can explain for us what we're looking at here. Uh, this is a side-by-side -side chart I made uh, in the laboratory when I was conducting uh, this comparison. Uh, I first started by doing my analysis of the latent print, which is on the left-hand side. It's labeled D, and it has a red, it has red markings on it. So there's a series of, I think, uh, 16 red dots uh, on that impression. Uh, and those red dots are my analysis. As I'm going through that print, I'm looking for the bifurcations and the ending ridges and the dots and the, and the different levels of detail. And, and that's how I'm documenting my, my analysis of that print. And, and in the end, I concluded that it was um, suitable for identification. Uh, and I thought that it was a finger. So then I drew that uh, red arcing shape on the top. So that's a, a marking that indicates that that is a, a latent print uh, that's um, of value, and I'm going to move forward to compare it to uh, someone. So then I started to uh, compare it to a fingerprint card that ha was marked uh, Timothy Verrill. Uh, as I go through that card, I realized that um, one particular finger, uh, the number four right ring finger, had a similar uh, level one um, ridge flow and pattern type being a whirl. Uh, and then as I started to go through the various uh, red dots I made on my latent print, I could see those same features in the same orientation, in the same relative position to each other on uh, the exemplar print. Uh, so as I go through, I found all 16 of my original dots from the latent. I found them in the same spot on the exemplar. And I came to a final conclusion that that latent print marked D from exhibit GMH 15, the black trash bag, was made by Timothy Verrill's number four right ring finger. Turning next to your analysis 
of a latent impression recovered from TLE 69, the container on the right. On the screen now is State's Exhibit 67. Uh, what are we looking at here? And I'm using the laser pointer, but there's also a laser pointer on the desk. If you'd like to use that, it's up to you. Uh, okay. Yeah. What are we looking at here? Uh, this is a second chart I made uh, in the lab that, that same day that I worked on it. Um, so this is the other print that I looked at. This is a latent F that was developed on uh, TLE-69. So that uh, latent is on the left-hand side. Again, I, I followed the same procedure. I followed the, the ACE methodology, so my analysis step was first. I went through that print and I made markings you, you know, using the red dots, I, I was marking the, the different uh, level two uh, features that I saw, so the bifurcations and the ending ridges uh, and the dots. Uh, so I made those markings, uh, and then I determined that that print was uh, of value for comparison purposes, so I put the, the red um, marking over top, indicating that it was a suitable finger impression. Um, and then I started to compare it to uh, the exemplar of Mark Timothy Verrill. So I, this is a different pattern type than the last uh, comparison I did. The last comparison was a whirl pattern, uh, but this particular latent D uh, has more of a looping formation in the core, uh, which is the center of the print here. And this is a delta formation, it's a triangular formation. So. Uh, I zeroed in on the uh, number two right index finger of Timothy Averill that, that's also a, a right slanting loop formation with a large delta formation. Uh, so as I looked at my, f my 14 plotted red features on the latent, I was finding them uh, on the exemplar print in the same relative position to one another in the same location and orientation. Uh, and I ultimately came to the evaluation that um, Layton F was made by the right index finger of Timothy Verrill. And lastly, looking at this chart, which is States Exhibit 62, are the results of your analysis with respect to the black garbage bag, GMH 15, and the plastic container, TLE 69, incorporated in the highlighted portions of this chart? the two identifications that you made. Yes, it is. Uh, one moment. I have no further questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Cross-examination. Yes, I did. And the purpose of that was to collect um, patent prints, if you saw them? Yes, one was to look for blood imprints, so any type of, of touching of skin or maybe clothing to see if there's a, a blood print. Yes, yeah, so that's a patent print. And um, when you did, you look for any latent prints? No, I did not look for any latent prints uh, at that time. Uh, latent prints are very difficult to develop on skin, but I was just looking for blood prints at that point. Well, in addition to the bodies, you also had materials to look at. Yes. And one of those materials was a plastic bag. Yes. And did you examine it for latent prints? I did not. You said that what you do is you look for identifiable prints. Uh, well, that's the ultimate goal. We look for all prints, and then later on during the analysis, it will be determined if those prints are identifiable or not identifiable. So you're saying that you didn't see any prints when you were at the autopsy? Right. I didn't see any prints that I, I felt were documentable, no. Well, no. My question, so there's either documented prints or there's none. Did you see any prints to be documented? No. You went to the crime scene? 
Yes. And by the way, at the autopsy, who did you report to? Um, I don't specifically recall. Would it be Tara, um, Tara Osmond? Yes, that sounds right. And same thing at C, you reported to one of the te detectives that was directing the evidence collection. That's right. You didn't decide what to collect. Correct, yeah, we're there to assist uh, the investigators. And one of the things they had you do is to look at certain areas of the house to look for blood stain prints. Correct. That was, you didn't find any. That's correct. You went to the garage to look for prints. Yes, two days later I went back to the scene and processed areas in the garage for blood prints. Did you find anything there? No, I had, I had documented some prints that had the initial appearance of blood, um, but they did not test positive with a blood reagent. Um, so I surmise that they were probably some sort of uh, paint or stain or something like that. Thank you. Any redirect? Uh, no. May this witness be released? Yes. Thank you, sir. You may step down. Thank you. <clears throat> State next calls Emily Rice. Good morning. Good morning. When you come around the back side of the witness stand, I'll have you step inside, but I will ask you to remain standing for a moment. I need to raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give the jury will be the truth and the whole truth under the penalties of perjury? I do. Please be seated. Can you please uh, introduce yourself to the jurors? Good morning. My name is Emily Rice. And where do you work? I work for the State of New Hampshire Department of Safety State Police Forensic Laboratory. And uh, what is your present assignment at the lab? I'm a criminalist too in the laboratory. And for about how long have you worked at the state lab? Um, I've worked for the state labs for 24 years, but the first five years were toxicology, so I've worked for the State Police Forensic Laboratory since 2005. And uh, what particular unit or units do you work in at the state lab presently? I, I currently work in the pattern evidence unit, um, which is fingerprints, footwear, tire tracks, firearms, tool marks, things like that. And can you please go over your training and experience? And I'd like you to focus on the processing of items for latent impressions, as well as the analysis for latent impressions. In 2005, I began a training program through the New Hampshire State Police Forensic Laboratory. It was about a year and a half long program. Um, I worked under four senior criminalists with about 50 years of experience between them. I worked cases um, alongside them, but ultimately um, for them after I reach, reached a certain point in my training process. Um, along the way in this training program, there's multiple modules of a variety of information that um, you need to read text and journals regarding and be tested either practically or written exams along the way. Anything from embryology and biology, um, <coughs> history of the science of fingerprints, APHIS databases, uh, processing, examination, comparisons, things like that. Um, I also attended three external week-long courses on fingerprint identification or um, and a three-day palm print class during that year and a half training program. Um, once I was um, completing the requirements of the training program, I took a competency exam and a written exam and had a moot court, 
which made me qualify by the state of New Hampshire to perform fingerprint processing and uh, comparison. For about how long have you been processing items for latent impressions as well as conducting latent impression analyses? Since 2006. Are you also a certified latent print examiner? I am a certified latent print examiner. And through what organization are you certified? Um, I, at, in 2007, I qualified after two years of working in the field um, to sit for the International Association for Identification um, latent print certification exam. Uh, it's the oldest forensic organization in the world um, and is the only one for latent print examiners for a certification. In addition to conducting your own latent impression examinations, do you also the re review the analyses conducted by other examiners? Yes, I do. Have you testified in courts of law as an expert in latent impression processing and also latent impression analysis? I have. Uh, about how many times and in what courts? Um, specifically for latent print examinations, um, about 17 times in various county courts in New Hampshire, superior level courts in New Hampshire for uh, Merrimack County, Hillsborough County, North and South, Stratford County, um, Cheshire County, Merrimack County. Uh, I might be forgetting some, but multiple counties in New Hampshire. And how about processing? Um, we don't usually separate out the two, um, so I, I don't really have a breakdown of processing versus comparison. It's usually latent print comparison, identification, and analysis, all of it together. And at this point, I do offer the witness, Ms. Rice, as an expert in latent impression analysis. Any object? All right, she'll be so qualified. I want to turn your attention to the work that you did in this particular case, and did your forensic work in this case with respect to latent impressions entail both the processing for the presence of latent impressions as well as the analyses of recovered impressions? Yes, it did. Was it unusual that you conducted both processing, looking for latent impressions, as well as analyzing the impressions that were found? No, that's not unusual. Was there any particular reason why you did processing for some items, analyses for some items, and both processing and analyses for some items? Um, it's generally because of staffing and who is available to perform the duties. Um, we had somebody in our laboratory at the time that processed but didn't perform comparisons. So to essentially lighten the load for other people, uh, she was focusing on processing when she was available um, of a lot of that evidence. So if I was available, I would do the processing. And if she was available, she would do the processing. And the person that you're referring to, the jurors haven't heard a deposition testimony from an Anne Elizabeth Polonzi, but is that the, the other processor in this case? That is, yes. So let's focus on your role in processing for latent impressions first. Did you process a number of items and not find any identifiable latent impressions on them? I did. Were among the items that you processed for latent impressions and did not find any identifiable impressions, some items that were found in a black garbage bag with corresponding evidence number GMH15? Um, I'm not entirely sure where they came from, but they had a GMH15 sub-designation, so that generally means they came from that object. And what specific items with corresponding evidence number GMH15, as well as a letter, did you process for latent impressions and not find any identifiable impressions on them? Uh, GMH15A, which was portions of a cellular phone, and GMH15G, which was a cleaning fluid. If we can focus on the cell phone, GMH15A, is it unusual based on your experience that an item such as a cell phone, which is designed to be held and operated by hand and using one's thumb and uh, fingers, 
that that's processed and no identifiable latent impressions are actually found on the item. I wouldn't say it's abnormal. Um, a lot of times it's a, it's a good surface on the front to leave a, an impression. However, there are objects that we touch so often like a cell phone that um, you're essentially able to obscure the fingerprints as you touch the item over and over and over again or you slip it into your pocket and those fragile impressions rub away. So it's not entirely s surprising that I didn't um, recover an identifiable fingerprint on the cellular phone. Were items GMH-15A and GMH-15G the only items that you processed for potential latent impressions and found no identifiable impressions on them? Um, I believe there was also a knife, TLE-60, uh, which I processed and didn't find identifiable fingerprints and um, at some point, I also processed some paper towels and did not find any identifiable fingerprints. So continuing on this topic of your role in processing items for latent impressions, is there a difference between processing an item and recovering a latent impression and recovering an identifiable latent impression? Uh, yes, so uh, an identifiable latent impression would have sufficient information, whether it's because of the clear quality and the quantity of information that's in that uh, recording, that I would be able to compare it and perform a meaningful, meaningful comparison to uh, a record standard from an individual. Um, impressions are everywhere, however, they may not be clear enough for us to work with. In this case, did you process several items and recover from those items identifiable latent impressions? Yes, I did. So next on the screen is going to be States Exhibit 43. It shows items with evidence numbers GMH 15, TLE 55, and TLE 69. Were you able to recover identifiable latent impressions from all three of these items with those evidence numbers? Yes, I was. So let's first discuss the item with evidence number GMH15, the photo on the far left. You just discussed that you process items that had that same evidence number, GMH15, as well as a, a letter designator as well? Yes. You uh, searched or examined two items and did not recover any identifiable latent impressions on them, one of them being a cell phone? Yes. Was your processing able to recover identifiable latent impressions from GMH-15 itself, the black garbage bag? Yes, it was. And were you able to uh, recover as part of that processing one identifiable latent impression or multiple identifiable latent impressions? Uh, multiple identifiable impressions. And as part of your processing, did you document where those multiple identifiable latent impressions were found on GMH 15? Uh, I did record the general location of the impressions that I found. And where generally did you find those latent impressions on GMH 15? Uh, multiple different areas on the outside of GMH 15. Uh, were there also some impressions that were found inside GMH 15 as well? Um, for GMH 15, I believe there was one impression that was on the inside, however, it was not identifiable. Let's turn to the item with evidence number TLE 55. And was a clear garbage bag with that evidence number another item that you processed and found identifiable latent impressions? Yes, it was. And for TLE 55, did you find one identifiable, identifiable latent impressions or multiple identifiable latent, latent impressions? I found multiple identifiable latent impressions. And did you also, as part of your processing, again, document where those identifiable latent impressions were found on TLE 55, just like you had with GMH 15? 
Uh, yes, I documented the general locations. And where generally did you find identifiable latent impressions on TLE 55? Um, there were multiple impressions on the outside of TLE 55, um, as well as two impressions on the red drawstring and two impressions on the inside of TLE 55. And when you say the red drawstring, is that the portion of TLE 55 that's highlighted in red and has been enlarged to the right? It is, yes. Let's turn next to item with evidence number TLE 69, the item on the far right highlighted. And this was another item that you processed and was able to find identifiable latent impressions? Yes. And uh, did you find just one identifiable latent impression or multiple identifiable latent impressions? Uh, multiple latent impressions. And where generally did you find the latent impressions on TLE 69, this plastic container? Um, one was on the label, one was on the cap, one was on the side opposite the handle, and also in the handle area. And when you say the cap, is it the top, this black portion of the container? Yes. And with respect to the handle, am I accurately pointing to that area with the laser pointer? Yes. I believe it was on the inside more than as you so pointed to the outside, but yes, the handle. Those three items there where you found multiple identifiable latent impressions, GMH 15, TLE 55, and TLE 69, do you see those items listed on this chart, which is States Exhibit 62, highlighted on the far left column in yellow? I do. Let's switch gears now from your processing of items for potentially identifiable latent imprint, uh, impressions to your actual analyses of recovered impressions. You said uh, you also did that in this case? Performed comparisons in this case, yes. With respect to your analyses of recovered latent impressions, was that analysis limited to the latent impressions that you recovered from the three items that we just reviewed, the black trash bag, the clear trash bag, and the plastic container, or were there other items that you analyzed uh, in which identifiable impressions were found? Um, there were other items that I analyzed that had identifiable impressions also. And with respect to who found those impressions on the other items that you analyzed for comparison purposes, who conducted the processing of those items? Uh, those were processed by Anne Elizabeth Palanzi. <coughs> we're going to go over your analyses uh, more momentarily. But as to your conclusions, does States Exhibit 62 reflect latent impression identifications that you were able to make on several items? Um, it does reflect identifications I made on several items, yes. Does this chart include all of the latent impressions that you were able to identify in this case? No, it does not. With respect to uh, wording on this chart, and I'm going to focus your attention to the far right column and some terminology, uh, fingerprints is highlighted. Uh, what do you refer to when you say fingerprints? Um, so fingerprints on this chart is grouping anything that would be uh, any of the portions of the finger. So it may not be the, the distal phalange, which is the top part that people think of as a fingerprint, but it may be one of the, the lower phalange <clears throat> on, the, on the finger. Uh, could it also be a thumb as well? It could also be a thumb, yes. We don't differentiate specifically a, finger, a thumbprint and a fingerprint. Yes. Looking at another highlighted term on this chart, uh, palm print. What do you mean by palm print? Uh, a palm print would be anything below the fingers, so not including the thumb or the fingers, but any, anything in this area of the, of the palmer surface. And lastly, looking at this chart and some highlighted terms, we have simultaneous fingers impression. Uh, fingers is not misspelled. That's how it's supposed to be, right? 
That is how it's supposed to be, yes. And what, what is a simultaneous fingers impression? Um, so a simultaneous impression is when more than one portion of the hand would make contact with an object at the same time. Um, there are clues in the deposition of friction ridge detail that allow us to determine that three fingers may have touched a surface at the same time. Maybe there's a slide that's associated with them so you can tell the contact all occurred at the same time. So instead of uh, breaking them up into individual fingers, we may call that entire three finger impression a simultaneous fingers impression rather than a finger, three fingerprint impressions. Now, the jurors just heard from criminal, criminalist Ostrowski about an identification that he made on one recovered latent impression from the black trash bag with corresponding evidence number GMH15, which is pointed out by the red arrow, and another identification that he made on one recovered latent impression from a plastic ice melter container with corresponding number TLE69, which is pointed out in the blue arrow. Did you also make identifications from multiple latent impressions recovered from those same two items? I did. Were any of the identifications that you made on latent impressions recovered from these two items of the same latent impression as criminalist Ostrowski or different latent impressions or both? Um, both. I also identified the impressions that criminalist Ostrowski identified and then I went on and continued additional comparisons and made additional identifications uh, at a later time. As to the, these two items on the chart, GMH15 and TLE69, are the impressions identified on this far right column highlighted in yellow the total identifications made by both you and criminalist Ostrowski? They are the total identifications made by both of us, yes. So before we go over the analysis that you conducted that are indicated on this chart for the other items that are not highlighted, did you also analyze identifiable latent impressions recovered from a carpet cleaner vacuum with corresponding evidence number TLE 225? Yes, I did. And how many identifiable latent impressions were recovered from that item, the carpet cleaner? Um, there were 10 identifiable latent impressions recovered on that item. And were you able to make an identification of any of those 10 recovered impressions? Uh, yes, I was. I was able to identify eight of them. And based on the examination that you conducted, who were you able to identify as the source of eight of the ten impressions recovered from the carpet clean? Um, eight of them were identified to Christine Sullivan. And as to the remaining two impressions on the carpet cleaner, were you able to make an identification? I was not. And why not? Um, the individuals that I performed comparisons against, uh, most of them didn't have complete friction ridge exemplars, full recordings of their known impressions. So I was inconclusive when I compared to multiple individuals. Uh, so you said that not only Christine Sullivan's exemplars did you compare to the uh, impressions found on the carpet cleaner, but multiple others as well? Correct. Uh, was one of the multiple others uh, Timothy Vera? Yes, it was. And did you have sufficiently detailed exemplars from Timothy Verrill to exclude him as the source of the two other latent impressions that were found on the carpet cleaner? Yes, I did have um, clear and complete exemplars of Timothy Verrill, and I excluded him from those other two impressions on the carpet cleaner. And does that mean that Timothy Verrill never touched that carpet cleaner? Um, no, we can't really say that. You can touch an object and not leave a fingerprint behind, um, but he was not the uh, depositor of those two impressions. It doesn't mean that somebody didn't touch an object, though. You testified that eight of the ten impressions found on the carpet cleaner belonged to Christine Sullivan. Could you rule out Christine Sullivan as the source of those remaining two impressions that were unidentified? I could not rule Christine Sullivan out on the remaining two impressions. And why not? Um, I didn't have complete Friction Ridge exemplars of Christine Sullivan. I would have needed 
additional records uh, to complete comparisons. And to your knowledge, was her body available for such further exemplars at the time that more exemplars were determined in order to make a, de uh, a conclusion as to her? I don't believe her body was um, available anymore. Uh, again, before we go through the items on this chart, did you also analyze latent impressions recovered from a shovel with corresponding evidence number TLE33? Yes, I did. And how many separate latent impressions did you analyze uh, from the shovel? Um, I analyzed three impressions on the shovel. And uh, the person who actually processed those prints and were able to find them, that was criminalist Polonzi again? Yes, it was. Did all three of those latent impressions recovered by uh, criminalist or formal criminalist Polonzi turn out to be identifiable? Uh, no, one was not identifiable. Which means, again, if something is unidentifiable, what's that mean again? Uh, it means there's not enough information in the deposit of ridge detail for me to perform a comparison and potentially find the source of that impression. With respect to the two recovered impressions that were identifiable on that shovel, are their locations depicted in States Exhibit 63? Uh, yes. And as to those identifiable impressions on the shovel, were you able to make an identification of either one of them? Um, yes, I was able to make an identification of a fingerprint, um, but there was also a palm print that I wasn't able to identify. With respect to the fingerprint that you were able to identify, who were you able to conclude was the source of that identifiable latent fingerprint? Uh, the fingerprint was identified to Buddy Seymour. As to the second ide identifiable impression on the shovel, I believe you said a palm print, were you able to make an identification of that impression? I was not. And again, why not? Um, the Many of the records that I um, had for individuals to be compared were not complete enough for me to make a, a final conclusion. I guess if uh, we can talk about that a little bit, we heard about major case prints. Were most of the exemplars that you received not major case prints? Most of the exemplars, exemplars that I received were not major case exemplars. So when you say incomplete or insufficient, they just didn't have enough of the print details like a major case uh, print might have? Um, correct. So we typically call them complete friction ridge exemplars, um, and they really record the entire surface uh, that's the goal, to record the entire surface of the palm, the fingers, the sides of the fingers, everywhere that you have friction ridge detail. Um, even in the, our live scan capabilities that we have today, it's very difficult to capture all of that information with, um, without taking pen and paper, um, or ink and paper, and multiple copies of somebody's hands. Focusing again on the second identifiable latent impression, the palm print that you were not able to identify. Even though you weren't able to identify the source of that palm print, were you able to exclude several people as the source of that impression? Um, yes, I was. Could you rule out or exclude John Seymour as the source of that second identifiable latent impression that was found on the shovel, the, the palm print? I could not exclude or identify um, Buddy Seymour, John Buddy Seymour. And uh, we refer to him as John Seymour, but you also realize he has a nickname called Buddy? I think um, some of the paperwork said Buddy, yes. And why was it you were not able to exclude uh, Buddy John Seymour as the source of the second, the palm impression on the shovel? Um, the records for his impressions didn't reach high enough up, up into the palm area. Uh, the friction ridge detail appears to be right here at the base of the fingers, um, and it's kind of often not captured in recordings, so I just needed a little bit more information at the top of the record. And with respect to you needing a little more information, you're aware that John Seymour has been deceased for several years, and so additional prints could not be obtained from him? 
Um, I don't believe I was aware at the time, but I became aware after, yes. You said that uh, several people were actually excluded as the possible source of that palm impression on the shovel? Um, I know of at least one. I would have to reflect on my notes in order to determine who all of the people were that were excluded. Well, let me ask it this way. Was Timothy Verrill among the people who you excluded as the source of that second identifiable impression on the shovel, the, the palm print? Yes, I excluded Timothy Verrill from having made that palm print impression on the shovel. And similar question to the question I asked you about the carpet cleaner. Does that mean that Timothy Verrill never touched that shovel? Uh, no, I can't tell if somebody didn't touch an object. So next on the screen is States Exhibit 44. Did you also conduct analyses of potentially identifiable latent impressions that was recovered by former criminalist Polonzi for items with unique evidence numbers TLE 54, TLE 55, TLE 55D, TLE 55G, TLE 55K, TLE 55, I'm sorry, TLE 56, and TLE 57, which are all seen on this photograph? Uh, yes. With respect to potentially identifiable latent impressions that we recovered from these items, did you compare those recovered impressions with the known impressions of various people, including Timothy Verrill and Christine Sullivan? I did. Based on the analysis that you conducted, were you able to determine the source of latent impressions recovered from evidence numbers TLE 54, TLE 55, TLE 55D, TLE 55G, TLE 55K, TLE 56, and TLE 57? Um, yes, with the exception of one impression on TLE 55G. Uh, the conclusions that you made, are they summarized in States Exhibit 62? Um, the conclusions with respect to identifications are listed on States Exhibit 62, and then there's just one additional unidentified impression that's on one of the tape pieces. So the tape pieces is TLE 55G that you talked about? Yes. And there was one unidentifiable impression on TLE 55G? Uh, there's one unidentified but identifiable impression on the tape pieces um, that I excluded as having made, been made by Timothy Verrill, but I did not exclude Christine Sullivan. And was that for the same reason that you discussed before? You didn't have sufficient exemplars for Ms. Sullivan's prints? Yes, I didn't have complete enough <clears throat> records of her impressions to complete a comparison on that one last impression. So let's discuss your conclusions as they're summarized on this chart. And with respect to those conclusions, did you provide comparison photos of a few of the identifiable impressions and known exemplars to illustrate how you conducted your analysis and came to your conclusions? Um, yes, I did. So Judge, we have about 10 more minutes, 15 more minutes. Do you want to continue or you want to take a break? Well, why don't we take our break now because we've been going for about an hour and 15 minutes and we'll break until 11.25. So that's less than 15 minutes and then we'll work until 12.15. Okay, so 11.25 back in the courtroom. Thank you. Please rise.
Please rise, Jury Anchor. you can resume when you're ready before we took the morning break we were looking at states exhibit 62 and we we're talking about the comparisons that you did of identifiable impressions found on TLE 54 TLE 55 D TLE 55 G TLE 55 K TLE 56 and TLE 57 I wanted you to talk about your conclusions and the next few slides will have some photos to help you explain what you did. And we're first looking at a photograph from, from States Exhibit 32J, which depicts TLE 56. Is this next slide, States Exhibit 78C, a comparison photo for one of the identifiable impressions found on that spray paint can that you found matched Timothy Verrill? Um, yes, this is a comparison chart that I created uh, marking my findings, um, ultimately determining uh, an identification of the palm print to the right palm of Timothy Verrill. And so if you can explain for us what we're looking at in this slide and how these photographs help you make the conclusion that you made. Um, sure. So on the left-hand side, um, that is the latent impression or a portion of the latent impression and I've um, enlarged it on my computer screen in Photoshop. Um, I've also um, done digital processing to if it's a color image I may turn it to black and white just because it's a little easier to compare uh, black and white ridges to black and white exemplars which for the most part are our exemplars are black and white. Um, there is a large portion I have. Uh, this is the hypothenar area of a palm print, and this is the thenar area of a palm print. Um, and that's the hypothenar is the under the little finger, and the thenar is under the thumb. There's some characteristic creasing and ridge flow um, that I'm used to seeing in those areas, so it helps me orient the impression. And at first, I'm just doing an analysis on the impression, determining is it a finger, is it a palm? Um, do I have enough information that I think I could identify it? And I'll mark features that I'm seeing so that when I later bring up a exemplar impression, I can compare the features that I've seen in just the analysis portion to the known impression. Um, so on the, the left is the latent impression, and the, the right side is a cropped portion of the known right palm of Timothy Verrill. And the red dots that you can maybe faintly see are um, me marking some of the level tube features or the minutia, the ending ridges, bifurcations that I'm observing in the latent, and then comparing to the, um, the, the known exemplar to see if they're in agreement or if they're in disagreement. So this small area here, it may be hard Hard to tell that, but that area is in agreement with this area right here. And then it's, it's very hard for me to see the dots on here and do a laser pointing. But what I'll do is uh, mark, mark a feature that I see that's in agreement between the two. And then I'll count ridges up in the same direction, so up and to the right or up and to the left, and determine if I see another feature that's in the known, in, the exemplar impression, I'm sorry, the uh, latent impression, and determine if I also see it in the, the latent impression. And by continuously um, determining the spatial relationship of those features, seeing if they're in agreement or if they're in disagreement, I can come to a conclusion. If they're in agreement, the conclusion uh, would be an identification. If there's a disagreement of those features, then um, I would be excluding that individual. And here, this was an identification, correct? In this, this is an identification. Uh, what's the AZ labeled on the bottom left? 
The, um, the line on the bottom gives me, a, a, I, I'm drawing uh, a line to denote the orientation that I think the palm is in the upward direction like this as shown, and then the AZ is the latent identif identifier. Um, I went through the alphabet starting with A, A, B, C, D, all the way to Z, and then started over. There was a lot of latent impressions in this case, so I started over um, with A, 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 B, all the way to A, Z, so this would be the uh, 54th latent impression in the case. Let's turn to an item with evidence number TLE 55G. On the screen is a photo from States Exhibit 32L and 55G has been highlighted in red. Next on the screen are States Exhibits 78A and 78B. These comparison photos for two of the identifiable impressions found on TLE 55G that you determined matched, Timothy Verrill? Um, yes, those are comparison charts that I used to document what I was seeing, and my ulti ultimate conclusion was that they were an identification to Timothy Verrill. So let's look at each one of these two comparisons. We'll start with the one on the left here. So what are we looking at on this slide, and how did it help in your analysis? Um, so on the left-hand side is the latent impression. It's latent impression AQ. Um, it's just a unique identifier that it was given. Uh, this latent impression is on tape. It was developed with um, a fluorescent dyeing material. Uh, so I did convert it to black and white in order to be able to compare black ridges to black ridges in a known. Um, but prior to looking at the known, I did an analysis of the features that I was seeing in, in the latent impression. It's a little bit, um, uh, it's a flexible surface being taped, so there's um, some areas that you can see where the tape is folding over a little bit, um, but this is the ridge detail that I'm talking about all the way down to here. This is all one impression. Um, and I'm initially analyzing to determine if it's a finger or a palm. Then I'm marking the features that I'm seeing, determining if it's identifiable. If I determine it's identifiable, it'll move on to comparison. Um, and then I'm gonna compare those features that I observed in analysis and compare them to record impressions of known individuals. So in this case, the identification was made to Timothy Verrill and I have um, plotted what's in agreement, the features that I'm seeing in agreement between the two. Um, so this area up here, it might be a little bit twisted in the counterclockwise direction, but it is the same as the features that I'm seeing here in the tip area of the right, right ring finger of Timothy Verrill. And then this information down here and down towards um, the bottom of the latent all of these features are also in agreement between um, the latent impression and the known uh, number four finger of Timothy Verrill. I just used two impressions of the same finger, so two known impressions, because they each recorded um, a little bit more information either from side to side or from forward to backward. So it's not uncommon to use multiple impressions of the same finger. Uh, of a known impression to uh, come to a conclusion. And if we now look to 78B, uh, if you can explain what we're looking at here and again, how that helped your analysis. <clears throat> uh, sure, so AV is a different latent. It, this one was developed on the, the sticky side of the tape um, and developed with um, material that we paint onto the the sticky side. So I analyzed the impression to determine if it's identifiable. Like as before, I marked features that I saw in a, in, um, throughout the impression that I would help to determine um, a conclusion later when I did a comparison. Uh, but initially, I'm just marking the features. The red dots are some level two details that I'm seeing that I want to use as target groups in order to compare to record, other record impressions. Uh, so once I'm done with my analysis, just based on the latent impression on the left, I'll pull up a comparison um, image. I'll determine if there's an agreement or disagreement of those features. So uh, this one is pretty easy to see, I think. Um, it's a, what we call a short ridge. So it really is just a line, a small line in the middle of those ridges. 
um, and it's in agreement right here. And then what I'll do is count um, up from this short ridge. I'm counting one ridge, two ridges, and then I have another one that's bif that's ending or bifurcating right there. And that minutia is, sorry for my shaky hand, it's really hard to keep it nice and straight. Um, so that's that same minutia in agreement. And I'll do this continuously, keep continuing to count the ridges until I reach another feature, and then I can assess if it also is in agreement. So I did this systematically throughout all the impressions to come to the conclusions. And your analysis for the many other identifiable recovered late impressions that you examined, was it similar to what you just described for the jurors in the last three photos, that we, slides that we saw, state 78A through C? Yes, it was. With respect to your analysis of recovered latent impressions on the three comparison slides that we just looked at, you were able to make a conclusion as to identity? Yes. Were you able to make a conclusion as to identity for many other latent impressions that you analyzed? Yes, I was. Going back to State's Exhibit 62, your ultimate conclusions with respect to latent impressions that you looked at for items processed by former criminalist Palanzi Evidence numbers TLE 54, TLE 55D, TLE 55G, TLE 55K, TLE 56, and TLE 57, are they summarized on this chart again? Yes, they are. And so going to <laughs> TLE 54, what was your conclu conclusion with respect to the latent impressions that were found on that item? Uh, the identifiable latent impression um, was identified to Timothy Verrill. It was a portion of his palm, and it also continued up into a finger. What was your conclusion with respect to latent impressions found on the item with evidence number TLE 55D? Uh, that latent impression was identified to Christine Sullivan. What was your conclusion with respect to latent impressions uh, identifiable latent impressions on the item with evidence number TLE 55G? Um, one identifiable latent impression was not identified to anybody. Uh, the, I didn't complete comparisons on it. Um, but otherwise, four latent impressions were identified to Timothy Verrill and five latent impressions were identified to Christine Sullivan. What was your conclusion with respect to latent impression on the item with evidence number TLE 55K? Uh, that latent impression was identified to Timothy Verrill. What was your conclusion with respect to latent impressions on the item with uh, evidence number TLE 56? Both of those impressions were identified to Timothy Verrill. And what was your conclusion with respect to latent impressions on the item with evidence number TLE 57? All of those were identified to Timothy Verrill. So the items that we just reviewed were processed by former criminalist Balanzi and analyzed by you. I next want to turn to items that were both processed as well as analyzed by you. And items from which you were able to identify the source of a latent impression. There again, evidence numbers GMH 15, TLE 55, in TLE 69 depicted on this photo? Yes. Did your uh, identification analysis proceed along the same general lines that you outlined earlier with the slides? Yes, it did. Your conclusion as to impressions on those three items, GMH 15, TLE 55, and TLE 69, are they also summarized on States Exhibit 62? Yes, they are. What was your conclusion with respect to latent impressions that were found on the item with evidence number GMH 15? All of the identifiable impressions were identified to Timothy Verrill. The total number of identified impressions seen below this photo, uh, 6 plus 8, 14, does that include all of yours as well as the separate identification made by criminalist Ostrowski? It does. Going back to your processing of this black garbage bag, were you able to make identifications for all of the identifiable latent impressions that you recovered from this item? I was. And who was the source of each one of those recovered impressions based on your analysis? Uh, Timothy Verrill was identified as having made all of them. 
Uh, put another way, were there any identifiable latent impressions recovered from this black garbage bag that did not belong to Timothy Vera? No. <clears throat> what was your conclusion with respect to the latent impressions found on the item with evidence number TLE 55? Uh, all of the impressions were identified to Timothy Verrill. Going back to your processing of this clear plastic uh, garbage bag, were you able to make identifications for all of the identifiable latent impressions that you recovered from this item? Yes. And who was the source of each one of those recovered impressions based on your analysis, all 19? Uh, Timothy Verrill. Uh, put another way, were there any identifiable latent impressions recovered from that clear garbage bag that did not belong to Timothy Verrill? No. What was your conclusion with respect to the latent impressions found on the item with evidence number TLE 69? Um, they were all identified to Timothy Verrill. The total number of identified impressions seen below the photo, 4 plus 3 is 7, does that include all of yours as well as the separate identification made by criminalist Ostrowski? Yes, it's a combination of the two. Going back to your processing of the plastic ice melter container, were you able to make identifications for all of the identifiable latent impressions that you recovered from that item? I was. And who was the source of each one of those recovered impressions based on your analysis? Timothy Verrill. Put another way, were there any identifiable latent impressions recovered from this plastic ice melter container that did not belong to Timothy Bear? No. One moment. I have no further questions. All right, thank you. Uh, Cross-examination. Thank you for your patience while I set that up. So good afternoon. Excuse good morning. Me, good morning. <laughs> done oh, that twice. Almost. Okay, Ms. Rice, so uh, you work in the State Labs Pattern Evidence Unit, right? Yes. Um, and you work primarily with fingerprints and latent print impressions? Um, I'd say the majority of the work is latent print impressions. Um, and you're familiar with how um, the state police operate with the major case coordinator with respect to homicide cases? Yes. Um, essentially that person, well, in the name is a coordinator, um, meets with investigators. Is that right? Meets with investigators below the coordinator? Yes. Um, and occasionally he meets with members of the prosecution's office? Yes. Uh, and as a group, it's determined um, what testing uh, should be done from the evidence that's collected? Yes. Uh, and uh, when you collect evidence from the scene or otherwise, you don't actually analyze or conduct 
any testing until you're directed to by uh, the case coordinator or somebody else in the lab. Correct. And when you don't receive a directive to conduct further testing on evidence, um, you often aren't given a reason? No. Uh, and sometimes you can make recommendations back about how evidence should be tested or what kind of evidence should be tested? Um, I'm, I'm sure I can make recommendations. I don't, I'm not sure what type of example you would be referring to though. Just thinking if it's a back and forth sometimes or if they say, can you test this? And you say, this other piece of evidence might go with this or there's a better way of testing it? Uh, that could happen. Uh, but ultimately, it's not your call whether to test a particular piece of evidence. No. All right, so turning to the fingerprints or latent impressions, I just want to make sure I'm clear on a couple of things. Um, I think as you mentioned, and we heard from one person before you, simply touching an object doesn't mean that somebody is going to leave any latent prints behind. Correct. Um, and there are a number of factors that could influence um, when an impression is left behind. That's true, yes. Those could be environmental factors like weather, rain, snow. Yes. Uh, whether somebody is wearing gloves can affect whether an impression is left behind, right? Yes. It's highly unlikely or nearly impossible for an impression to be left behind when wearing gloves. It is not impossible, but it is highly unlikely, yes. For example, you wear gloves in the lab to ensure that you don't contaminate or upset samples? Yes, and to protect myself from the items and protect the items from me. Makes sense. So in order to leave prints, there must be some sort of contaminant on the skin? Yes. Like, in other words, finger, fingerprint residue? Correct. That could be sweat. Is that right? Is sweat an example? Yes. Uh, oil from the skin? Yes. And blood's another example? Yes. And that residue is not just on fingerprints, it could be palms, toes, feet, right? Correct. Uh, and there could be a contaminant that's pre-existent on an object that uh, a print could be depressed into. Is that right? Yes. And the object that a person touches will also influence whether an impression is left. That's true. And the quality of the impression that's left. Yes. Would you say, in general, a smoother, non-porous surface is more likely to re retain an impression than a porous one? Um, not necessarily porous versus non-porous, but a smoother surface is more likely to retain an impression, yes. Okay. So, talked about how it happens, the, uh, the surface, now the, the timing of a, a latent impression. Because you can extract an impression or analyze it or compare it, it doesn't tell you when that impression was left. Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't tell you when uh, that person touched the object? No, it doesn't. It doesn't tell you who the last person who touched that object? Uh, very rarely could you determine that sort of information, no. Uh, it just tells you at some point that person touched it. Correct. Uh, and on the other hand, the absence of somebody's prints on an object doesn't mean that they necessarily didn't touch it. Like, this podium might not have my prints on it, but I have been touching it, right? Correct. Uh, we heard an example of a shovel. Uh, there were no prints on that shovel that were matched with tin, right? Uh, that's correct. Um, in fact, you excluded him uh, from the identifiable prints as coming from him? Yes. Um, but it doesn't mean that he didn't touch it at some point. Correct. Um, and it doesn't mean that it was not touched by people other than the person you identified at some point also. Correct. Same with TLE 69, which was the ice milk container, right? There were impressions that you identified as coming from Tim? Yes. But that doesn't rule out that nobody else touched it at any point. It does not. It doesn't tell you when he touched it. It does not. It doesn't tell you if he was the last person to touch it. It does not. The final thing about this is that the number of prints that you find on an object doesn't necessarily equate to the number of separate contacts a person has with an item. 
Um, no, it doesn't directly relate to that. We try to group things, as I was explaining, simultaneous impressions. We try to group them together if we know it was one contact. Um, but if, it, if I make 20 identifications on an item, it doesn't necessarily mean it was touched 20 different times, um, especially if this right index finger shows up multiple times, well, you can't leave your right index finger multiple times all at the same time. Um, they have to at least be a second apart from each other, so. Thank you for the explanation. Um, so I'm just gonna ask about some processing techniques. Um, there are different techniques that you can use, is that right? Yes. Um, and the chosen technique will depend on the nature of the object you're testing? Yes. Uh, it will also depend on whether the impression uh, was left in blood or not? Correct. Uh, so if an impression appears to be left in blood, uh, then that involves a specific technique? Uh, there's a series of techniques that could be used for blood impressions. Um, and when you employ one type of technique on a particular impression, that excludes any further techniques from being used? Uh, it drastically minimizes the effects that other techniques would, would um, <clears throat> that other techniques would work as well as they would have. Okay. So you want to be careful about the type of technique that you use. Correct. And the impressions that you talked about today, none of them were left in blood, right? Um, none of them appeared to be in blood. The black trash bag was very dark in color, so it'd be very difficult to determine um, if there was a blood component to the latent print residue. Um, I didn't observe uh, bloody impressions, but I can't tell you for certain what those were made of. And you didn't employ those techniques that are designed to uh, work on bloody impressions, right? Uh, no, the black trash bag wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been able to see the emperors is also dark. And on all the other ones that you did, the uh, TLE 55, which was a clear bag, and the ice melt, which is a clear bottle, uh, there were no impressions left in blood on those. Um, those I wasn't able to see any bloody impressions and didn't process for bloody impressions. Um, you tested and did comparisons in this case, or analysis and comparison in this case, uh, more than one time, right? Yes. Um, I think it, it seems like most of your uh, testing was in February and July of 2017. Um, I would have to look at the dates of my reports to remember the exact time frames. My approach? Yes. For a refresher memory, you just look at the dates of these reports. Yes. I think I know, I think you know where to look for those, so I'll show them here. Okay. Thank you. And what was the question again? Okay, so the, the time frame in which you conducted the testing for this. Um, 2017, 18, and 19. Okay. And the last one in 2019 is January 3rd, 2019? Yes. Um, you have testified quite a bit to this, um, particularly the objects in dark purple, uh, which are TLE 55 
and three of its children um, objects, and again, D, G, and K. So I'm just going to go quickly through each of these. Um, TLD 55, um, you testified most of those prints were outside of the bag? Correct. Um, and two of the prints were found on the uh, red pole strap at the top? Yes. And um, just because two latent prints were found on that red strap doesn't mean that they were left when that strap was being pulled or when the bag was being cinched? Um, no, not necessarily. They could be slightly exposed um, without it being cinched. And again, you don't know if those, and you didn't see that those were, those impressions were left in blood? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry, I, I, I jumbled it. Uh, those impressions were not left in blood? Um, I didn't observe any reddish brown uh, fingerprint residue, so I don't believe they were left in blood. I think we'll get to an abbreviation later, but uh, RBS seems to be a common abbreviation. RBS would be referring to a reddish brown stain in general, but that's not necessarily uh, directly related to what friction ridge detail is deposited in. That just sort of denotes that it looks like this might be blood, so analysts can understand what is being brought to the lab? Uh, yes, it's a common acronym. Uh, again, for 55D, which is a lighting box, um, that impression was not left in blood? Uh, no. Uh, same with 55G, which was the um, clear tape? No. And on the clear tape, the impressions were both on the adhesive side and the non-adhesive side? Yes. And again, 55K, which was a, a clear bag within the uh, larger bag, um, the single fingerprint on that was not left in blood? Um, again, as with all of these, there could be minute amounts of blood in any impression. It's just whether it has a reddish brown hue to it that would allow us to uh, determine to process one way or another. So I can't definitively say that it doesn't have it. However, that was not the observation. So you didn't, you didn't observe it on any of these, and you didn't process it as if it was, right? Uh, some of these I didn't process, but I didn't process any of the items um, for bloody impressions that you have here. Okay. Or you also testified you reviewed items, reviewed other processing. Correct. And there's nothing in these that you either analyzed, processed yourself, or reviewed that said that those prints were impressed in blood? Um, correct. There was nothing that uh, made me believe that they were in blood. OK, so again. This chart mentions four items and relating to TLE 55. Hey, Roshan. Yes. I'm sorry, what's marked as Defense Exhibit AF. Now, there are four items on that chart that the state presented. But that didn't encompass your complete review of what was in TLE 55. Well, objection basis of knowledge, you didn't actually process any of the items in TLE 55. All right, can you try to lay a foundation for her basis of knowledge on that? Uh, you reviewed all the items or, or processed the items in TLE 55? Um, I reviewed photographs of developed impressions of items in the TLE 55 series. And then two of them I processed myself, A and G. And you wrote a report about all of the uh, impressions and processing and examinations of every item in TLE 55? Um, the report included the work of another individual. Okay. So you reviewed the work of the other individual while 
uh, you put this in your report? Um, I reviewed it to the extent that I could transfer it into the report. Okay. Uh, and was that from uh, Ms. Polanzi? Yes. Who the jury will hear from? And again, I'm going to just approach to show you that the Do you remember what date that is? July 17th, 2018. So by creating this report, you are familiar with the other objects that were in that, in that bag. Um, I am do you want, do you familiar. want me to show you the report? Pardon? Would it be helpful to you just to see the report? Is that the same one you just showed me? Um, I have a copy of it, but it oh, would be okay. if I'm allowed to refer to that. Yes. Thank you. So I will begin with TLE 55A. Do you remember what, which item that is? Um, and I apologize, earlier I said I processed A and G, but that was of the GMH 15 series, not of the TLE series. So I apologize for that. Um, TLE 55A is a decorative lighting box with reddish brown stains. Okay, and what about TLE 55B? Um, TLE 55B is a metal rod with reddish brown stains. And what about TLE 55C? A metal rod and decorative end cap with reddish brown stains. And that brings us to TLE 55D, which was on the exhibit that was shown to the jury. Can you just remind them what that says? A uh, decorative lighting box with reddish brown stains. And then TLE 55E. A uh, candle holder with reddish brown stains. And TLE 55, please. Sorry, 55F, excuse me. Uh, multiple paper towels with brownish stains. And I think you mentioned that on direct at the beginning that that was one of the items that you had processed at the beginning. Um, I know it was paper towels. I'm not 100% sure on which paper towels, but it might have been that one. Okay. Um, so moving on, TLE 55G, again, that was on State's Exhibit 62, which the jury saw. That is multiple pieces of clear tape with, <coughs> with reddish brown stains. Yes. And TLE 55H, please. Decorative elephant with reddish brown stains. Okay. TLE 55I, please. Uh, lighting fixture with reddish brown stains. TLE 55J, please. Do you mean K? That's right. So it skips between I and K on that report, right? Yes. And do you remember TLE 55J being a towel with blood on it? Um, I remember there being a towel that was not conducive to processing. Okay. And that was in TLE 55? Um, I'm not 100% I'm not sure what the exhibit number was. 
Okay. Actually, uh, it might even say it in here. No, it's not. Um, yeah, it's not listed on this. Uh, and it wasn't conducive to, to testing. Correct. And that's because uh, of its surface? Uh, yes, generally cloth-like material does not um, recover identifiable impressions very well. Okay, uh, and um, so next is uh, TLE 55K, please. Uh, one plastic bag with reddish brown stains. Okay, uh, and again, that was on States Exhibit 62? That is one that 55K? you 55K? 55K? Um, yes, I believe it was. Okay. And then there's TLE 55L, right? Yes. And can you read what that was, please? Uh, one plastic cup. Is that a cup or a cap? Thank you, cap. Okay. Now this report also contains the results of the analysis of those items that we just reviewed. Right at the end, at the bottom of page, uh, at the bottom of the page, the second page, and into the third page. Um, analysis and some comparison, yes. So for TLE 55A, were there any identifiable impressions that were developed? So again, injection basis of knowledge. <coughs> she did not do processing of any of the items in TLE 55. All right, you'd say you need to lay the foundation for knowledge. Uh, you reviewed the results of that of, of those examinations, right? Uh, I reviewed them to the point to incorporate them on the report. Okay. And you signed your name at the end of this report? Yes. And you submitted this to Lieutenant Brian Strong at the New Hampshire State Police? Yes. So you are confident in the results of this? Um, well, I have a statement that another criminalist was involved. Um, so I can't speak specifically for the work that uh, she did. However, I transcribed the information to the report. Okay, so are you saying that you are excusing yourself from all liability when the major crime unit reviews this report and it's wrong? Uh, what liability are you talking about? I mean, if it's wrong and they come to you, do you say, hey, not my, not my problem, it's my signature, but I'm not, I can't be held accountable for it? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. Are you or are, are you not confident in results when you review them and sign your name to them and send them to the major crime unit? I am confident that I took the information from the notes and put it onto the report. Okay, and that is to protocol of the state lab. Um, we actually do it a little bit differently now, and the. Uh, if this case was done today, that examiner would have written the report for all of those processing findings. So tell us what the protocols were at the time of this report. Um, the protocol at the time was the person who processed the evidence um, would turn notes over to a comparison person and I would transcribe the information from her notes and incorporate it into my report so it didn't, so the investigators didn't have to get multiple reports on the same subject matter. And you followed the protocol of the state lab? When you I did. did that? Yep. So I'm going to ask you about the results of TLE 55A. Why don't you come up?
So, Ms. Rice, when you were writing these reports on this case, um, you were too busy to review the work of your colleagues when you were writing this report? Uh, I wasn't too busy to review her work, but that's, I'm not reviewing her work as a technical um, manager when I'm writing that report. Okay. Um, I'm going to go on to the analysis of TLE 225, um, which is the uh, uh, carpet or rug cleaner. She testified that, uh, to that on direct. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. So just a couple follow-up questions on that. Um, that was an object with several latent prints on it that you analyzed? Yes. Um, and you were uh, able to identify some of those latent impressions as belonging to Christine Sullivan? Yes. And none of those latent impressions belonged to Tim Barrell? They did not. Uh, in fact, he was excluded um, from uh, any of those impressions? Correct. Uh, now, two of them were, two of the impressions on that item were left unidentified? Yes. Um, but just because something's unidentified doesn't mean that you still can't exclude somebody, right? Um, no. Uh, and the two unidentified impressions on this, you were able to exclude Tim as the contributor of those? I was able to exclude Timothy um, to those last two impressions that were unidentified, correct. Uh, and you wouldn't be able to compare uh, those prints to anyone unless you received prints that had a high enough quality to make a comparison? Um, yes, that's true. Uh, so to this point, uh, as far as you know, uh, Christine Sullivan is the only person whose prints have been identified on that object? Correct. Uh, so if there was a subsequent investigation that revealed that there were prints that were left after she had left them that would not be inconsistent with the timing of fingerprint analysis that we've discussed. Namely that prints could follow uh, or someone else can touch an object after prints are left and those prior prints can remain. I'm not sure I understand the first part of your question, um, but to the second part, if I understand it correctly, um, prints could be left behind and another individual could touch an object and may or may not leave impressions. And someone or multiple people could have touched that carpet cleaner after Christine, but we can't make that conclusion. That is true. Uh, I want to ask you about the TLE 33, which was the shovel. Again, there were no prints from uh, Tim on that shovel. No identifiable impressions of Timothy Verrill on that shovel, no. Okay. Uh, and he was actually excluded from the identifiable prints? Yes. Uh, and one of the identifiable prints was identified as belonging to John Seymour? Yes. Who's also referred to as Buddy? Yes. And it's possible, uh, there's another uh, a print that's, that remains that's unidentified? Is that right? Yes. Uh, and it's possible that the identified print and the unidentified print were both left uh, as the result of a single grasp? Uh, it is possible, yes. And from the unidentified print, Tim was also excluded from leaving that print? Correct. And Mr. Seymour was not excluded from that unidentified print? Correct, he was not. And again, that unidentified print is a palm print, right? Yes. Uh, and you weren't able to do comparisons of that palm print at all to Josh Caldwell? Uh, correct. Or Ian Bates? Correct. Uh, and that's in part because you didn't have palm prints to, uh, from them? Correct. So we've heard a little bit about the difference between fingerprint records and major case prints. Um, can you explain what exemplars are? 
Exemplars are known recordings of an object. We use that term for, uh, in DNA world, uh, fingerprints, footwear. Uh, it's just a known recording in the fingerprint world of somebody's friction ridge skin. Uh, so initially in this case, uh, for these objects, or the first objects you were asked to analyze and compare, uh, that was to compare latents only to Tim? Initially, yes. Uh, and you actually uh, yourself requested that uh, higher quality uh, latent prints be collected from Tim? Yes. Uh, so that could be an example of you making a request about evidence? Correct. Uh, and you, in fact, received those higher quality prints? Yes, I did. Uh, and you were able to um, complete the analysis because of those higher quality prints? Yes. Now, subsequently, you were asked to compare latents that uh, you processed or latents that you were going to analyze uh, to a number of different people. Is that right? Yes. Um, first, there were the two victims, Ms. Sullivan and, and Ms. Pellegrini. Correct. It probably would be helpful to you to, to look at the names on your report unless you can remember them off the top of your head. I don't. You can, would it be on the report that you have? Because you can refer to that. Um, I have multiple reports. Okay. But Why don't you show her the report you are sure. referring to? The January 3rd report on the second page. Yeah, go ahead. I think I found it now. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Can you review the names on that third paragraph? Third paragraph on a specific page or third paragraph for the whole report? On the second page, please. Um, and state the names or review? No, just, just review them. Okay. All right, so some of the other comparisons you did were to uh, Dean Smaronk. Yes. Uh, Stephen Clough. Yes. Michael DeTroya. Yes. Josh Caldwell. Yes. Robert O'Neill. Yes. Ian Bates. Yes. John Seymour. Yes. And of course, the two victims. Uh, now, fair to say, when you're doing this analysis, you were unaware of who these people were? Um, I don't remember knowing anything except, I believe, um, the first name was the homeowner, and that's all I remember knowing. Okay. Um, now, these, the prints that you received for these people were not through the major crime units. This was not major case prints that were provided to you? Um, I don't remember exactly where all of them were obtained from. Okay. Um, what's available um, uh, in terms of these prints that were provided to you uh, depends on the person. Which person? If they had pre-existing prints in a database. Um, yes, it could in part be because of that. Okay, and none of the impressions of these eight that you analyzed were as complete as Tim's? Um, they were not complete friction ridge exemplars. Okay. Um, uh, you were limited in your comparison analysis because of the incomplete or unclear records of all eight of those individuals? Um, for some of the con comparisons, yes, I was limited by the, the records that were supplied or available to me. Uh, and you needed more comprehensive comparisons uh, to complete uh, those comparisons? I needed additional records to complete comprehensive comparisons, yes. Uh, and you, have, you, in fact, put that in your report? Yes. Uh, and that was sent to Major Crime Unit, Lieutenant Brian Strong? Yes. 
and you in fact never received any additional prints from any of those individuals? Um, I'm at, at one point, I feel like I may have well, received one of them for an additional comparison. But in general, I did not receive better known impressions. Do you know if you received one after January 3rd, 2019? I know I did a report for Michael Detroit, okay. um, a li like a limited report, but I don't, I don't remember the date of that. It could have been before this report. It could have been after. Okay. Now, putting that possibility aside, it sounds like you're not sure if there was any follow-up to that. Um, because of that, you weren't able to make any of those additional comprehensive comparisons. What does he mean by of those? I'm not can, sure what counsel's referring to. Can you just clarify the question, of those? The comparisons that you said you needed uh, more clear and complete friction ridge exemplar impressions. And you put that in your report on January 3rd. The comparisons that you wanted to do with those could not be done because you did not review or, excuse me, receive any additional uh, uh, submissions of impressions. Um, so the paragraph that you're talking about is one specific latent and I was not able to complete comparisons to that one specific latent because I didn't, I never got um, impressions that were complete enough for me to work with. There's more than just that one impression though, right? More than just that one impression, what do you mean? That uh, you needed more complete, uh, you needed more, a better, and clear submissions to make a complete comparison? There were more latents that were unidentified that I needed better clear impressions to complete comparisons. Okay, so just to be clear, because you said with this paragraph it was referring to one, but what you're saying now is correct, that there were more than just that one. Correct. Ask about TLE 69. That's the bottle of ice milk. Um, you said that there, are, uh, regarding one of the prints, um, there was one uh, print that was located on the cap. Yes. Uh, and that print was on the side of the cap. Yes. Uh, and that single print was cut off by the cap, meaning that either that print was either hanging over the top or under the top? Um, it, it was essentially cut off on the bottom. It was on the bottom, okay. Uh, and again, just because there's an impression on an item, that doesn't tell you how that item was handled? Um, no. It could be op from opening the top, right? Could be. But it could also be from simply holding the bottle or carrying it? It could be. All right, I want to ask about GMH 15, that's the black bag. Uh, the vast majority of the finger and palm prints on that bag were on the outside of the bag? Correct, all the identifiable impressions were on the outside of the bag. Okay. Uh, and again, the number of prints on a bag or on, on an item doesn't equal the amount of times that uh, it necessarily was touched? Uh, no, it doesn't, it could be more or less. All you know is that Tim at some point came in contact with that bag? Correct. And as you said, there were a couple of impressions on the inside that uh, turned out to not be identifiable. Um, there was at least one impression that I documented and determined to not be identifiable. I can't remember if there was two like your question asked.
Did you also examine uh, GMH 15G? Yes. And that was a Advantage 20X bottle and cap? Yes. Appears to be, yes. Now, this also, or this was not on the state's chart that was presented to the jury earlier? No, it wasn't. And there were no prints that were found on this bottle? Correct. Now, this bottle was sent to the lab as a high priority, right? Um, it was one of a group of items that were asked to be expedited. So that means that the lead investigator thought that this was pretty important? Well, Sustained. How do you take a rush request to mean? Um, I generally don't have the conversation if I'm going to do the work. So um, certain items are identified as being potentially important to a case and asked to be expedited. So would you say in your common sense, a rush or expedited request would mean that an item has potentially high evidentiary value? Um, it could mean, it could mean that. And how many years, again, have you worked at the state lab? Um, 19 in the pattern evidence unit. Have you developed an understanding of what rushed means? Yes. So this was a pretty important item determined by the investigators. Sustained. Did you, in fact, follow the order to do a rush examination of this? Um, it was done out of order. However, um, the processing that I did initially was paused upon the identification of um, a couple of fingerprints in the case. So it was done out of order, just not the weekend work that we were asked to do. Now, you talked about I'm almost done. You talked about uh, processing some bloody paper towels. Yes. And you said there were some, but you don't remember where they came from? Um, I don't think that's what I said. I just don't remember the exhibit number. There may have been more than one set of paper towels in the case. Um, I don't know where they came from. However, if there's more than one set of paper towels in the reports, I just can't remember off the top of my head which ones I did and which ones um, Anne Elizabeth Polanzi may have processed. Okay. Um, since we reviewed the other report uh, that had, regarding TLE 55, I think it's safe to say that the paper towels in that were processed by criminalist Polanzi. I don't know. I could look at my notes if you would like to figure out which ones I processed. Well, how about TLE 80? Is that paper towels? That's, that is paper towels. I'm, I'd have to look at my notes to figure out the exhibit number for the paper towels. Okay, can I direct you to your report from July 17th, 2018? You can direct me to the report, but the report might be transcribed information from another examiner, so it's not gonna help me figure out if it's the paper towels that I processed. Did you not re review your lab notes or bench notes before testifying here? I did, and it's about 800 pages. Some of these items are pretty important in a homicide investigation. Yes. Bloody paper towel is probably pretty important. 
um, bloody paper towels that I didn't have any identifiable fingerprints on might rise lower in the list of things that I memorized for testimony. So you have no recollection of where the bloody paper towels that you processed might be? I never know the exact location that objects are found at a crime scene. I'm saying in your reports or in your um, lab notes. What exactly is your question, sir? My question is I'm trying to figure out which group of paper towels you analyze so I can ask about it. And I'm happy to look at my notes to figure out which set of paper towels I processed. Well, I'm not sure how much time we have, but um, let me ask you another question before we do that. I'll ask you about some things you didn't test. Things that might not be in reports. Did you test any um, surveillance cameras, meaning the hardware not looking at footage, but did you test any physical cameras for fingerprints? I did not. Did you test any buckets? I did not. Whether it's a metal bucket, there are no metal buckets you tested? No. There were no plastic buckets that you tested? No. Uh, you didn't test any um, doorknobs or deadbolt locks? I didn't test any, no. I guess my question for the paper towels could be just summarized. And do you remember how large or how many paper towels you reviewed? Um, I believe there were multiple paper towels. And can you put a, a finer number on that? Pardon? Can you put a finer number on that? I can't without looking at my notes. So folks, what we're going to try to do is finish up this witness before we break for lunch. Is everybody okay? All right. <clears throat> if I show you a picture of the TLE 80, which is blade paper towels, might that refresh your memory if that was the item you processed? I don't think it would. I think my notes, which I'm happy to look at, if I may, would refresh my memory on which paper you, towels I looked at. Do you have those readily available? I do. You? Why don't you take a, a moment to look them up?
found the item that you were just speaking of, TLE 80, and I did not process those, but I have not yet found the paper towels that I did process. So if that helps. I'm not sure if that helps you. In my review of your reports, if this helps, there were two items of paper towels that were bloody that were listed in your reports. One was TLE 55F, which you testified earlier was one that you did not process. And that was in that report. And then TLE 80. I believe I stated that I wasn't sure which exhibit number I did earlier. Um, I do remember there was paper towels that when I was ready to write the report, I realized that the processor, Ann Elizabeth Polanzi, hadn't processed one of the items in the report, um, and she wasn't available to continue to do the work, so I jumped in and did the processing of one item. So if there was two sets of paper towels, um, I believe that's probably what happened. She did one set and I did the other. So that, would that be TLE 55F? Yes, I process TLE 55F. And there were no prints on that, right? There were none. This is what you described earlier as multiple paper towels? Yes. Are these the only paper towels you processed through the entire case? Yes. All right, any redirect? Very, very briefly, Judge. So just to be clear with respect to the identifiable but unidentified impressions that we've gone over today, right? Yes. There is one from TLE 55 to the tape, right? Yes. And there is one from the shovel, which is TLE 33, right? Yes. And there are two from the carpet cleaner, TLE 225, right? Yes. And those are the only identifiable but unident unidentified prints. Correct. Yes. But going back to Skates Exhibit 62, uh, on the far right-hand column. There are over 60 separate latent impressions. All these were identifiable? All of those were identifiable, yes. And also identified? And also identified. Thank you. No further questions. Any recross? I just one question. Uh, the paper towels that we just discussed were not on that state's exhibit? They were not. That's correct? That's correct. All right, thank you. Um, yes, yes, you may step down on your excuse. Thank you. All right, folks, so we did go quite a bit longer than we usually do, so let's take lunch until um, you need a full hour. We can come back at 1.30 if everybody's okay with 45 minutes. I got mostly head yeses. <laughs> I didn't get any no's, but I got a couple of blank stares. <laughs> For those of you who did not shake your head yes, are you okay with 45 minutes? Yeah, you know who you are. <laughs> All right, we'll see you at 1.30. Please rise.
all set for the jury? That's all right. Come on in. Good afternoon, sir. If you could come around the back side of the witness stand, you'll see that it opens up. Yes. Step inside, and would you kindly raise your right hand and remain standing for a moment? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give to the jury will be the truth and the whole truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Please be seated. Good afternoon. If you could please start just by introducing yourself to the jury. Uh, my name is Jeff Verrill. What town do you live in? I live in Salisbury, Massachusetts. Back in January and February of 2017, were you living in the same place? No. Where were you living then? 30 Quaker Street, Newton, New Hampshire. What do you do for work? I'm a supervisory auditor with the Department of Defense. And who are your parents? Uh, Suzanne and Richard Verrill. Do you have any siblings? I do. Is Timothy Verrill one of your siblings? Yes. Do you see Tim in the courtroom here today? I do. Can you just point him out for us and identify something he's wearing? Uh, is that a gray sweater? I'd ask the record to reflect the witnesses identified Mr. Vero, the defendant. Any objection? No. It will. So I'm going to show you uh, up on the screen, and it should be on the screen in front of you as well, what's been marked with, as State's Exhibit 30W. Do you recognize the individual in those photographs? I do. Who is it? That is Tim. And back in January and February of 2017, what type of vehicle was your brother driving? I think it was a blue Honda CRV. And I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 71. Do the pictures in that exhibit appear to be the vehicle your brother was driving at the time? Yes. <clears throat> And back in that time frame, about how often would you see your brother? On the weekends. Okay. Once a month, twice a month? Three, four times a month. And where was he living during that time frame? Cushing Street in Dover. Was he living there with anyone else? Yes. Who was that? Uh, Crystal, his girlfriend, and then they had two roommates. And again, still talking about this time frame, late 2016 into 2017, what was the defendant doing for work? I wasn't aware of anything. Do you know if he was employed at all during that time? No. Do you know how he got money or what his source of income was at that time? No. Did you know or suspect at that time that the defendant was dealing or selling drugs? No. Did you know or suspect at that time that he was using drugs? No. I want to focus you now on a specific day in January, Saturday, January 28th of 2017. Do you recall that day as a day you went out to run some errands with your brother? Yes. Uh, and in the days prior to that, did you have any communication with him? 
Not that I recall. So tell us how it happened that you come to spend some time with the defendant on that Saturday, the 28th. For some reason, I had mail still going to my parents' house, even though I owned a property. And I would go up there on weekends to collect it. So you went to Dover and end up meeting up with the defendant? Yes. Do you remember about what time it was when you met up with him that day? No. And do you remember testifying in this matter previously in 2019? Yes. If I showed you a transcript of that testimony, would that help refresh your recollection? Yes. Start on line nine. You can review anything you need to, um, and then look up at me when you're done. Does that help refresh your memory? Yes. About what time did you meet up with the defendant that day? One one thirty. <clears throat> and what did the two of you do? We ran errands. Do you remember where you went? Uh, cell phone store, Target, Red Shoe Barn, Papa Bear Auto Care, and I don't remember if there's one more or not. Okay. Uh, whose car did you take when you went to run those errands? Tim's. And you mentioned uh, in there just now you went to a cell phone store. Where was the cell phone store? Downtown Dover. Do you know why your brother wanted to go to the cell phone store? No. Once you were actually at the store, what happened? I talked him out of getting a phone. So he was looking to buy a new phone and you talked him out of that? Yes. Why? I don't think Sprint's a very good company. Fair enough. Uh, did he tell you why he needed a new cell phone? No. Did you know whether or not at that point he already had a cell phone? I don't remember. And again, if I show you a transcript of that prior testimony, would that refresh your recollection? Yes. This is page 875. You can review whatever you need to on that page and look up on you. I'm sorry, what was the question again? Did he have a, already have a cell phone at the time you went to that cell phone store? Okay. Okay. Does that have professional memory? Yes, that says that he did. Well, do you remember did him having one at that time? My previous testimony says that he did. I don't remember. So you don't have an <clears throat> independent recollection of whether or not he had a phone? Time. Not, not currently, no. And reading this doesn't refresh your memory on that point? It states that I said it, so if I said it then, it was, must have been true. <clears throat> Did you know at that point whether or not he had actually been to that same store on that earlier that day? I don't remember. Did you have any discussion with him at the cell phone store about how he would pay for that cell phone? No. And did you know whether or not he had actually purchased a new cell phone earlier that day? That says that he did. Do you have an independent recollection of that at all? It was seven years ago. So reading that doesn't necessarily help you remember that he did, in fact, or did not uh, purchase a new cell phone earlier that day? 
if my previous statements have said that he had a phone earlier in the day, then he had a phone earlier in the day. So I'm going to show you now State's Exhibit 12A, and we see four photographs around the outside of that exhibit. Do you recognize the people in those photographs? I do. Who are they? Uh, Crystal and Tim. Crystal's wearing the red coat in front. Tim's wearing the white hat. <clears throat> and ultimately, you said you talked the defendant out of getting a new phone. Does he buy a new phone while you're there with him or not? No. Do you remember where you went next? <sighs> it was either Red Shoe Barn or Target. Okay. Well, let's talk about Red Shoe Barn first. Is that in Dover as well? Yes. Do you remember if the defendant purchased anything at Red Shoe Barn? He bought a pair of boots, I think. Did he buy anything else that you remember? Not that I recall. Okay. Do you know how he paid for the boots that he purchased at Red Shoe Barn? No. <clears throat> Did he tell you why he was getting new boots? No. And now I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 10A, and I'll focus you on the top two photos. Do you recognize the individuals in those photos? Yes, that is Tim in the front and me walking in behind him. Okay, so. Tim, it looks like he's wearing the red flannel and you're behind wearing the, the, looks like a gray shirt and a black coat? Yes. And then you mentioned uh, Target as well. Was Target also in Dover or was that somewhere else? It's either Dover or Summersworth. Did the defendant purchase anything at Target? Yes. What did he purchase? I don't remember. And if I showed you some of your prior testimony, would that yes. help? He got some clothes that day. Did you purchase anything at Target that you remember? Not that I remember. <clears throat> and did the defendant tell you at any time why he was buying these items at Target? No. Do you recall how he paid for those items? No. So I'm going to show you now State's Exhibit 22 and let's talk about the top row the photograph on the left and the photograph in the middle do you recognize the people in those photos yes that is me walking in the front and tim, tim behind we were in the same clothes as earlier and then on the bottom right photograph is that again you and tim yes and it looks like in that bottom right photograph you're both carrying bags do you remember if those were things he bought you bought both I don't recall making any purchases, so I must have helped Tim carry his stuff out. And you mentioned uh, as well a little bit earlier uh, going to Papa Bear Auto Care. Did you go to that shop after Target? Yes. And what did the defendant have done to his car at uh, Papa Bear Auto Care? He had an oil change, he had it vacuumed, and had his headlights resurfaced. Was that the last stop you made with the defendant that day? I believe so, yes. Where did you go after leaving Papa Bear? Uh, we would have gone to get my car, which probably would have been on Cushing Street. So back to the defendant's residence to get your car? Yes. About, about what time do you think you got back to his apartment to get your car? I don't recall. And again, if I showed you some yes. prior testimony, would that help refresh your recollection? <clears throat> so you can read. 
read anything you like on this page, but I'll focus you in the middle towards line 12 uh, on down. All right, so between 4.30 and 5. Do you know what uh, the defendant had planned for later that evening? I think he was going to go meet up with some friends. So is that the last time you see him Saturday the 28th when you go back to pick up your car? Yes. And having spent some time with him that day, running errands with him, do you recall how he was acting that day or what his demeanor was like? I do not remember. And if I showed you some prior testimony, would yes. that help? So it says he uh, seemed off. So he seemed off that day? Yes. Did he make any statements to you about why he might be off that day? He said he had stopped drinking. Did you know him to be a drinker at the time? Yes. Did you know him to have a drinking problem? I don't know if I would have called it a problem. Did he tell you when he had stopped drinking? Not that I remember. During the time uh, that you spent with the defendant on that Saturday, January 28th, did he ever mention anything about a Christine Sullivan to you? I think he received a phone call at some point during the day. Do you know who called him? No. And how do you know that this phone call uh, was related to Christine? He must have mentioned the name. Was there any discussion that you had with the defendant after that phone call about Christine being missing? I, I think I may have said I hope she's OK. Do you remember asking uh, the defendant if he knew anything about it? No. And if I showed you some prior testimony, would that help? Yes. Refresh your recollection. Okay, so I asked him if he knew anything about it. He said no. Do you remember uh, whether or not the defendant had any particular reaction to receiving that phone call? Not that I recall. Do you remember if he seemed at all concerned or alarmed? Not that I recall. Was there any additional conversation about the phone call after that? Not that I recall. Uh, so you said you part ways with the defendant about f between 4.30 and 5 that day. Did you have any other contact with him on Saturday the 28th? I think he texted me later in the day. What did he text you, if you remember? He needed a ride home. Did he ask you to pick him up? I believe he did. Okay. Did you? No. Uh, and do you remember where he was uh, when he texted you to pick him up? No. 
And if I again showed you some prior testimony, would that help? Yes. <clears throat> Just show you 886, and I'll ask you to start uh, at line 7. <clears throat> okay, so he was back home. You texted me that he freaked out and he was back home. So when he texted you to pick him up, he was as, as he was freaking out. That's how you described it. That's what was described there. Yes. Had that ever happened before, uh, where the defendant sent you a message that he's freaking out and he needs you to come pick him up? No. So that was an unusual event. Yes. Did you have any additional contact or communication with him after that on Saturday the 28th? Not that I recall. So now I want to move into the next day, Sunday, January 29th. Did you see the defendant on that day? Yes. Did you have plans with him for that day? I was going to do an impromptu cookout at my house. At your house? Yes. So uh, do you... Go to the defendant, does he come to you? How does that happen? I went up to Dover. And then you said the cookout uh, was at your house. So how do you guys get to your house from Dover? Uh, I drove my car. Um, I believe Crystal drove her car. Was Tim with Crystal in her car? I don't recall. Uh, so who all ends up at your house? Uh, it's me, Tim. I had a roommate at the time, and Crystal. While your brother was at your house that day, did he get a call from state police? Yes. Did the defendant tell you why the police were calling him? He said it was about Christine. What was his reaction to that? <sighs> he was uneasy. How did you respond? I asked him if he didn't, I said if he didn't know anything, then it's better to get it out of the way now <coughs> and be free and clear of it. Does the defendant tell you at that point if he's seen Christine lately? No. Uh, and then does he provide uh, the police with your address? Yes, he does. What did the defendant do after giving the police your address? He went outside to wait. What did you do? I poured a drink and I went outside to wait. I was going to go outside to wait with him. Okay. Did you see anything as you went outside to wait with him? Tim was driving away. Which car was he driving? Crystal's car. Where was Crystal as this was happening? Inside the house. Okay. So the defendant left your house in Crystal's car with Crystal still there? Yes. Did he do anything to the car before he left? At that point in time, I didn't notice. Did you later notice uh, yes. something on the car had been changed? Yes. What was that? License plates had been changed. Okay. And what license plates were on the car uh, initially? My, uh, they would have been Crystal's plates initially. Would those have been New Hampshire plates? Yes. Okay. And then what license plates were on the car that you noticed later? My roommate's license plates were on his car. Okay. Were those New Hampshire plates or something else? Massachusetts. Do you know where the defendant went, went when he left your house in Crystal's car? No. So now he's taken off. You've got police on the way to your house. What did you do? I called, I'm assuming the dispatcher explained the situation, 
and waited for the police to show, uh, police to arrive. Did you try to call the defendant? I must have. Do you recall if he ever answered? No. Did you try to text him? Probably. And again, do you recall if he ever answered? No. Was that like the defendant to just go completely off the grid like that? No. Did the police then eventually arrive at your house? Yes. What happened when the police got there? I spoke with one of the detectives and the other one spoke with Crystal. And did you agree to be interviewed and answer their questions? Yes. So uh, still talking about that Sunday, the 29th, after the police were at your house, do you see or have any contact with the defendant again at all that day? No. At some point on Sunday after the defendant left your house, did you learn that Christine was dead? Yes. How did you learn that information? It was either the news or a phone call. And what did you do with that information? Did you call and tell your mother? No, I told her the next day. So let's move now to that following day, uh, Monday, January 30th. What did you do that day? I would have dropped Crystal off at her house and I went to my parents' house. Did you see any cars at your parents' house when you went there? Yes. What, which cars? Crystal's car was there. Did you know that Crystal's car was going to be at your parents' house? I did not. And was it at that point that you noticed Crystal's car had your roommate's license plates on it? It was either then or when I was looking at the car later. So I'm going to show you now States Exhibit 70 and looking at the two photos on the top, do you recognize that car? Yes. Whose car is that? That would be Crystal's car. And we can see the license plate in the top right photo. Is that your roommate's license plate? Yes. So after you see the car outside, did you go into your parents' house? Yes. Did you find the defendant inside of your parents' house? Yes. Where was he? He was sleeping on the sofa. What did you do? I called the, the trooper that I had spoken with and told him that Tim was there. Did you have any conversation with Tim before the police arrived? No. Uh, so do the police then arrive at the house? Yes. And does the defendant go with the police after they get there? Yes. Do you see the defendant again later that day? Yes. Where? I picked him up from the Dover police station. Where did you go from the Dover police station? He wanted to come back to my house. So did you go back to your house? Yes. Did you have any conversation with him about where he went when he had left your house the previous day? No. Did you have any conversation with him about what was going on uh, with the two women that had been killed? No. Why not? I wanted to keep everything as stress-free as possible. So you're back at your house now with the defendant. What happens the rest of the day on Monday? I think he went upstairs to sleep. Do you remember uh, the police coming back to your house that day? Yes. And what happened when they came back? Uh, they had a warrant and they took him for several hours. Did he ever mention Christine or a woman named Jenna Pellegrini that day? No. So for the remainder of that week after Monday, going into the first few days of February, where was the defendant staying? He was staying in my house. <clears throat> were you working at all that week? No. Okay. So you were just staying at home with the defendant? I was taking leave, yes. And during that week that he's staying at your house, uh, do you remember the defendant telling you he's uh, hearing voices at any point? I don't think he described it like that, and it was at the hospital. He said something like the TV was talking to him, but it wasn't making any sense. And you mentioned a hospital just now. Did you end up taking the defendant to a hospital that week? To two hospitals that week. Okay. Uh, where did you go first? What was the first hospital? Exeter. Whose idea was it for the defendant to go to the hospital? It was his. And how did that come up that he wanted to go to the hospital? I don't remember. Uh, so you go to Exeter Hospital. Were you with him 
while he's talking with the hospital staff? I would have been in and out of the room, yes. And do you hear the defendant telling any of the hospital staff what kind of drugs he's using at the time? Yes. What were those? The ones that stood out were cocaine and methamphetamines. While at the hospital, did you also hear the defendant tell the staff how he got some scratches on his arm? Yes. What did he say? I don't recall exactly, but I remember the responses were different to different people. So you remember him giving two different descriptions to two different people about how he got those scratches? Yes. And you mentioned there was a second hospital. Which hospital was that? Uh, Holy Family in Haverhill. What happened when you went to that hospital? We were there for 13 hours, and the social worker found him a bed in a program. Do you remember what program that was? Uh, Leahy. Okay. What type of program is that? Uh, it, drugs, psychological. And what did you do after the social worker got him into that program? I dropped him off. So during this entire week that we've talked about, the end of January through the beginning of February that he's with you at your house, does he ever have any conversation with you about Christine Sullivan? No. Does he ever mention a Jenna Pellegrini at all? No. If I could have one moment. Yeah. That's all I have for you right now. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Cross-examination. Yeah, Dave. You are Tim's older brother? Yes. Um, you said earlier that um, on the Saturday that you went on errands that um, you seemed off that day? Yes. Um, and, but it wasn't just that day. He had been seen off the last couple of times you'd seen him. Yes. In fact, I mean, you talked to the police right after this happened, right? Right after he was arrested? Uh, could you explain the timetable a bit better? Sure. Um, just uh, try to say that you've been cooperative and answered questions to the police when they asked you. Yes. And you went to the grand jury. Yes. You testified at the first trial. Yes. And so when you said that he was off, what you say is, is that he was stressed and he had been stressed during that month. Yes. Um, so there was nothing in particular why you were doing the errands that you noticed that was different about him for that month. Correct. You'd said that um, you went to a car cleaning place. Yes. That his car is vacuumed. Yes. You don't know if you paid for that service. I do not recall, no. The, the receipt itself would be accurate. It, it would be, yes. Um, it's, your parents lived in Dover? Yes. So it makes sense that you would come up, visit them, and visit Tim around the same time? Yes. And you're close to your parents? Yes, I make it a point to see them as much as possible. And, um, and you also had close family. You, had close, you were close to a cousin at that time that wasn't doing well? Correct. Um, and were you planning a trip or trying to plan a trip for them? Yes, she had been diagnosed with terminal cancer and I was trying to get us a trip to Amsterdam. And was this the cousin that Tim was close with in particular? Yes. Uh, yes. And some information that you've gotten um, in Thanksgiving before this, right? Yes. And you weren't able to make that trip? No. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, redirect? Just briefly, you talked about the defendant being sort of off that entire month, so that one particular Saturday wasn't necessarily unusual. Was it particularly unusual for him to text you at a restaurant with friends saying he's freaking out and asking you to pick up? Yes, that was unusual. And was it particularly unusual for him 
to leave a cookout his girlfriend's car and leave his girlfriend alone. Yes. Any recross? Yeah, you're right. <clears throat> All right, thank you. You may step down and excuse. Yes. Uh, your next witness, please. State calls Suzanne Barrow. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm going to ask you to just walk around the corner. You'll see that the box opens up. Mm -hmm. And as you step in there, could you remain standing for just a moment and raise your right hand? Yeah. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give to the jury will be the truth and the whole truth under the penalties of perjury? I do. So you can step up and uh, take your seat. Just be a little careful there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Pull the microphone down a little, but you don't have to pull it forward. That should be good. Okay. Just try to keep your voice up as best you can. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. If you could please just start by introducing yourself to the jury. My name is uh, Suzanne Verrill. Where do you live? Andover. Are you married? Yes. Who's your husband? Richard Verrill. Two stepchildren. Are two of your children Jeffrey and Timothy? Yes. Is Timothy here in the courtroom today? I assume so. I haven't seen him. Well, if you can stand up. There he is. Okay. Yep. And That's can you just point him out and tell us something he's wearing? He's wearing, it looks like a gray uh, sweater. I asked the record to reflect the witnesses identified the defendant. So I want to talk about the time frame back around the end of 2016 going into January of 2017. What was the defendant's relationship with his brother Jeff like at that time? Um, they have always been very close. How often were you aware they would see each other around that time? Um, I don't know how often that they would see each other. They didn't share that with me. Uh, how close were they in age? They were uh, 18 months apart. And is Jeff the older brother? Yes, he is. During that same time frame, where was the defendant living? I believe with his girlfriend, uh, Crystal. Do you know what town that was in? It was in Dover. Had you ever been to their residence in Dover? No. And did you know about how long he had been living in Dover with Crystal? Not really. Do you know where he was living prior to living in Dover with Crystal? Um, I believe he was living with some friends. And again, uh, during this same time frame, what was the defendant doing for work? Um, I don't remember exactly what he was doing at the time for work. He has had uh, different jobs. Do you, did you and or your husband provide him with any money during that time? Um, rarely. So do you know at all what he was doing then around that time to support himself? No. During the same time frame, how often would you see the defendant? Occasionally. Would that typically be at your house? Yes. And I want to talk now about a specific day, January 28th of 2017, 
Uh, do you recall that night as the night you received a phone call from the defendant? Yes. Can you tell us about that phone call? He asked me to, to pick him up. Where was he? He was in Barrington um, in front of Dante's. It's a restaurant on uh, Route 125. Did he say anything else on that phone call? No, just asked me to pick him up. How did he sound on that phone call? He sounded a little upset. Has he ever called you for that type of help before? Yes. Can you describe that? Oh, it's, it, he would not have a ride. Mom, can you please pick me up? But is he, has he ever called you emotional, asking you to pick him up while he's out with friends? Uh, no. Do you remember about what time it would have been when you got that phone call? No, I do not remember. I know what? it was late at night. Okay, so later in the evening? Yes. Did you get any text messages from the defendant before that phone call, if you remember? I, I, I do not remember. I, I know you showed them to me, so I must have, but I don't remember. Okay. And I'm actually going to show you those now. So I'm showing you, uh, it'll, it's, should be up on this screen and also on yours. So on the first page, we have three messages here at the bottom, and the second page has a single message at the top. So I'm going to okay. focus you on the three messages at the bottom of page one. Okay. And we see a, we just flip back to that. Mm -hmm. We see a name on the right-hand side, and it says Suzanne Verrill, uh, 603-767. 1026. Was that your phone number at the time? Yes. And that uh, first, go back again, uh -huh. sorry, apologies. Uh, that first message was sent at 6.36 p.m. on Saturday, January 28th, and it says, I've been having some weird days. It says that was sent from TV to you. Is that right? Yes, sir. And then there's another message at 6.36 p.m. on that same day, TV to you that says, I think I need to see a doctor. Yes. Is that right? Yep. And then at 6.39 p.m. TV to you, I've been having some weird days. Is that right? Yes. Okay. I'll take that back for now. Do you recall receiving those text messages from the defendant on that Saturday? Yes. So during, um, you get this phone call from the defendant, he asked you to come pick him up at Dante's. Do you go and pick him up? Yes, I did. How did he appear to you when you picked him up? He seemed upset. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can you just describe that a little more? Um, he seemed antsy. Um, and just generally just upset. 
Uh, do you remember describing to the police uh, that he was having a serious meltdown? Yes. Is that consistent with how he appeared at the time? Yes. Had you ever seen him acting like this before to this extent? Not as an adult, no. And how were you feeling at that point based on how he was acting? I was very concerned about him. What, where did you take him after you picked him up from Dante's? I believe we went home at that time. Home to your house? Yes. When you get home, was he still acting the same way? Yes. Did you know if your son was using drugs at that time? I assumed he was. Had you ever seen him on drugs that you're aware of? No. Had you ever had any conversations with him about the fact that he had been using drugs? Um, just minor conversations. So what did you do next? I believe I took him to Wentworth Douglas. And uh, that's Wentworth Douglas Hospital? Yes. Why'd you take him there? Because it's the local hospital. Did he make any statements to you about when he had last used drugs? I don't remember him saying anything about when he had used the drugs, but that he had been using uh, meth and cocaine and something else. So when you take him to the hospital, does anybody go with you, or is it just you and the defendant? It is just me and Tim. And now I'm going to try to show you. Do you see four photographs on that exhibit, and it's also on the screen in front of you? Yes. Can you identify the people uh, in each of those four photos? Uh, it is uh, Tim and I. And if you can look at the top left photo, uh, towards the bottom, there's a date and time stamp written in yellow. Are you able to read that? Yes. What does that say? Uh, it says 128, and then it's a little difficult to read the time. I assume it's 8.59 and some seconds. Would that be consistent with about when you arrived at the hospital with your son? Yes. And if you look at uh, the bottom two photos, does that look like you and your son leaving the hospital? Yes, it does. And do you see a date and time on that bottom right photo? Yes, it says 10.52 p.m. Would that be consistent with about when you left the hospital? Yes. Then? While you were at the hospital, uh, were you present with the defendant when he was talking to hospital staff? Yes. Did you hear him say anything to hospital staff about what kind of drugs he had been using? I, d I don't remember. Do you remember uh, testifying previously? Yes, the about the, the meth and the, uh, the cocaine I knew about and something else. So. so do you remember him saying meth and cocaine at the hospital? I, 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 he must have, yeah. Did he end up getting admitted to the hospital for treatment that night? No. So where did you go after you left the hospital? I believe we went back home, to our house. And how was he acting when you got back to your house? Um, I think he was still upset, so coming down from whatever he was using. During this entire time that you're with him on Saturday the 28th, so from picking him up at Dante's, bringing him back to your house, then the hospital, then back to your house, does he ever say anything to you about a Christine Sullivan? No. Or a Jenna Pellegrini? No. So what does the defendant do uh, when you get back to your house? I believe he went to bed. What did you do? I went to bed. Was the defendant still there when you woke up the next morning? I believe he had left by that time. When you woke up and he was not there, do you know where he went? No, I do not. You had picked him up at the restaurant the night before, so did he have a car at your house? I don't remember. Well, were you surprised that he was gone when you got up that morning? No, I imagine he had walked home. So, on that Sunday, January 29th, after you get up, you realize he's gone. Do you have any contact with him that day? I don't remember. Well, I'm going to go back. Uh, States Exhibit 16, and this is that second page we were talking about. Uh, there's a message 
from Sunday, January 29th at 10.29 p.m. TV to you. And again, we see your name there. Was that your phone number at the time? Yes. And the text message says, I don't know what I'm doing. Do you remember receiving that text from your son? Yes. Did you have any additional communication with him after that? I don't remember. It's been so many years ago. Did you see him in person at all that Sunday? I, I don't remember. At some point on Sunday, did the police come to your house? Yes, they did. Who were they looking for when they arrived? They were looking for Tim. Did you speak with the police? Uh, briefly. Did your husband talk to them as well? Um, I don't remember. Do you know where the defendant was when he sent you that text message at 10.29 p.m.? No, I do not. But at that point, now you know the police are looking for him? Yes. Did you know that the defendant had fled from the police when they went to Jeff's house the day before? No, I did not. So moving on now to the next day, Monday, January 30th, did the police come back to your house that morning? I believe they did. Were they again looking for your son? Yes. And where was he that morning? I don't remember. Do you remember if he was at your house? I don't remember. Uh, well, do you remember the police coming to your house and leaving with the defendant on one morning? Well, then he must have been there. But do you remember the police coming and leaving with Tim one morning? Vaguely. Do you remember if you had any conversation with him uh, before the police arrived and took him that morning? I do not remember. Did you see the defendant again uh, later that week? I believe we saw him when he was in a rehab center. So that would have been the next time you saw him was when he yes. was in rehab? Do you remember where that was? Uh, it was down in Massachusetts. Was it the Leahy? I think it was the Leahy where he was. Uh, and during that time, did you have any conversation with him about the fact that the police had been looking for him? I don't remember. Did you have any conversation with him about Christine Sullivan or Jenna Pellegrini? Never. Did you ask him those questions? No, I did not. And he never mentions anything to you about it? No. <coughs> if I could have one moment, to. Thank you. That's all I have for now. Okay. Cross examination. <clears throat> Hi, Julia. You um, you said that when you picked up Tim from the restaurant, he uh, it was pretty emotional. Yes. Hyper. Yes. Can you describe to the jury what his baseline is, personality, what he's normally like? Normally, it's pretty calm. Um, he he doesn't get upset easily. Is he talkative? Yes. And when he's um, calm, does he, uh, I'm sorry, so he's talkative when he wants to be or? Yes, a just a general. Okay. And does he like to move around when he's calm? Yeah, he does. So it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be unusual for him to walk back and forth while he's talking to somebody? No, that would not be unusual. What did he do? Did he have a job downtown in Dover before he became unemployed? Yes, he worked in a, a shop in the mill. What kind of shop was it? Uh, the gentleman produced items made out of rocks. And who made some of those items made out of rocks? I'm sorry, what? Who made some of those items made out of rocks? Tim. Tim made items. Made. He's artistic? Very much so. Shortly, in the months prior to Tim's arrest, it, um, 
Your family received sad news about one of his cousins? Yes. And uh, what was the nature of the relationship between Tim and the cousin's name is Robin? Yes, Robin. Um, they apparently had been in, in quite a bit of contact. Um, she was dying of a very rare form of cancer and she wanted to see Amsterdam before she died. And Tim wanted to go with her. And um, was she well enough to go to Amsterdam? No, she failed rather quickly. over seven years now. Uh, since that time, you've had to take care of your husband? Yes. Because he's not been well? Yes. And you've had a couple grandchildren into your life? Yes. And you're trying to help out your son, Jeff? Yes. Like what on your life? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any redirect? Yes. And then you may step down. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I want to start another witness. Sure. All right. State calls William Wright. Good afternoon, sir. If you could come up toward the witness stand, and you'll see that it opens in the back. Thank you. Ask you to step in and remain standing for a moment. Kindly raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give to the jury will be the truth and the whole truth under the penalties of perjury? I do. Please be seated. Thank you. Good afternoon. If you could please start just by introducing yourself to the jury. My name is Bill Bright. I am a trooper with the New Hampshire State Police. And are you assigned to a particular unit within the New Hampshire State Police? Uh, currently, I hold the rank of Major, and I oversee the Investigative Services Bureau. Okay. <clears throat> How long have you had that position? Uh, just since November of last year. Uh, I want to talk about the winter of 2016 into uh, 2017. Were you working for the Major Crimes Unit back then? Yes, I was. What was your position at that time? I was a trooper assigned to the Major Crime Unit as an investigator. So what were your duties back then as an investigator with the Major Crimes Unit? Uh, we process crime scenes, interview witnesses and suspects at major events uh, throughout the state of New Hampshire. So beginning on Sunday, January 29th of 2017, did you participate in the investigation into the murders of Christine Sullivan and Jenna Pellegrini in Farmington? Yes, I do. What was your role in that investigation? I was assigned as an investigator. Did you conduct interviews as part of your role in that investigation? Yes, I did. About how many people did you personally interview uh, as part of the investigation? Uh, somewhere in the range of 15 to 20. Were you the only investigator assigned to that case? No. About how many other investigators, uh, to your knowledge, participated in that investigation? There were dozens of other investigators assigned to that case. Was that only with state police or other law enforcement agencies as well? There were uh, several other law enforcement agencies involved as well. 
and to your knowledge about how many people were interviewed either by yourself or other investigators as part of this investigation overall? Uh, some, there again, somewhere in the range of give or take 100 uh, people were interviewed. Uh, some witnesses interviewed multiple times. Okay. And those interviews, did they just occur in New Hampshire or other states as well? Several other states as well. Okay. <clears throat> During the investigation, did you personally go to Florida to interview some potential witnesses? Yes, I did. And in addition to interviewing witnesses in Florida, did you also obtain records from a hotel named Allure Suites in Florida? Yes, I did. Was one of the people you attempted to locate and interview during this investigation a person by the name of Timothy Vero? Yes, it was. And we'll go through how you get to that, but do you eventually uh, meet with Timothy Vero? Yes. Do you see him here in the courtroom today? Yes. Can you point him out and identify something he's wearing? Yes, he's seated at the defendant's table with the gray sweater. I ask the record reflect the witnesses identified the defendant. Any objection? No objection. Okay. It, it will. So when did you begin making efforts to locate the defendant? January 29th, uh, 2017. What did you do initially in order to try to find him? We went to what we believed his residence was in Dover at 38 Cushing Street. And where's the relative location of Dover in relation to Farmington? Dover is southeast of Farmington. Okay, so I'm, gonna, I'm showing you, and it should be on the screen in front of you as well, States Exhibit 19. So we see Farmington up here. Would Dover be down off the map to the right over here? That's correct. So when you went to this address on Cushing Street in Dover, did you find the defendant? No. Did you see a vehicle parked in the driveway of that address? Yes. What kind of vehicle was that? It was a black Honda CRV. So I'm showing you now States Exhibit 71. Did the CRV in the driveway look like the vehicle pictured in these photos? Yes, it did. And after attempting to locate the defendant at this address, did you call a phone number in an attempt to contact him? Yes, I did. Do you remember what that phone number is? Uh, I remember it ends in 3727. Okay. If I showed you uh, your report from your investigation, would that help you remember the full phone number? Yes, it would. Yes, it does. So what was the phone number that you called? 603-969-3727. Uh, so now I'm going to show you States Exhibit 24. Do we see that phone number 603-969-3727 listed next to the line Timothy Verrill in blue? Yes. What happened when you called that phone number? Uh, there was no answer. Did you leave a message? I did. What was the substance of the message that you left? Uh, I introduced who I was and uh, mentioned that I would like to speak with Tim about uh, one of his friends uh, who had gone missing. And when you introduced yourself, did you identify yourself as a law enforcement officer? Yes. Several minutes after you left that message, did you get a call back from that same phone number? I did. How do you know it was the same phone number? Uh, it showed up on my caller ID on my cell phone. Did you answer that phone call? I did. What happened when you answered? Uh, I answered the phone as Trooper Bright, and uh, there was a short pause, and then the line disconnected. Shortly after that, did you call that phone number again? I did. What happened? Uh, male uh, voice answered the phone. I asked if it was Tim Verrill. He confirmed that it was. Um, I again uh, told him who I was and that I was hoping to speak with him uh, about his friend Christine. Did the defendant say whether or not he had spoken to Christine? He said it had been a while since he had spoken with her. 
And when you asked to speak with him, what was his response to that? Uh, he agreed that he agreed to speak with us. Did you then arrange on the phone where to meet the defendant to speak with him? Yes. Can you explain what happened after that? Uh, yeah, he told me that he was at his brother's house in Newton uh, at 30 Quaker Street. And uh, I told him that I would drive down and meet him at that residence. Did he tell you who his brother was? I don't believe so. At some point, did you learn who his brother was? Yes. Who was that? Uh, Jeff Verrill. So did you then go to that Quaker Street address the defendant gave you? Yes. While you were on your way to that house, did you receive information that the defendant may have left that residence where he said he would meet you? I did. What did you do as a result of learning that information? Um, I called Jeff Farrell. Okay. And when you called Jeff Farrell, did you speak with him? Yes. And without getting into the substance of that conversation, uh, after that phone call was a broadcast submitted looking for the defendant in a particular vehicle? Yes. What was that vehicle? That was a silver Honda Civic. And did you ultimately arrive at 30 Quaker Street? Yes. Going back to that phone call where the person who identified himself as the defendant agreed to speak with you, about how long after that was it that you arrived at Jeff's house? Uh, somewhere in the range of 30 to 45 minutes. Was the defendant there when you arrived? No, he was not. Was anyone else at the house? Yes. Who? Uh, his brother, Jeff, and Tim's uh, girlfriend, Crystal Felipe. Okay. Did you speak with Jeff and or Crystal? I spoke with Jeff and uh, my partner who was with me, Sergeant Matt Kohler, spoke with Crystal. After speaking with them, did you and other officers continue to look for the defendant? We did. Were you also still looking for the silver Honda Civic at that point as well? Yes. Did you ever find uh, the defendant or that car on the 29th? Not on the 29th, no. So jumping to the next day, Monday, January 30th, uh, you had not located the defendant still at that point? That's correct. Did you receive a phone call from Jeff Verrill on that day? I did. And again, without getting into the substance, what did you do as a result of that phone conversation? Uh, we went to 20 Casilli Lane in Dover. When you got to that residence, was anybody outside? Yes, Jeff Farrell. Did you notice any cars parked in the driveway? I did. What car? It was a silver Honda Civic. Did that car have a license plate on it? Yes, it did. What state was that license plate? It was a uh, Massachusetts license plate. And was that the same make and model car for which the broadcast had been issued the day before when you were looking for the defendant? Yes. Did you meet with Jeff when you got to the house? I did. Did he take you inside? He did. Did you see anyone when you went inside the house? Yes. Who? Uh, Tim Verrill was asleep on the couch. Did you have any interaction with the defendant after you saw him asleep on the couch? I did. What was that? Uh, I woke him up. Um, I introduced myself, uh, informed him that I was the trooper that he spoke with on the phone the previous day, and I asked him if he would be willing to speak with us about uh, his friends Christine and Jenna. And at that point, were you aware that this was no longer a missing persons investigation and that Christine and Jenna had been killed? I was. Did the defendant agree to speak with you? He did. Was he under arrest at that point? He was not. Even though he was not under arrest, did you uh, conduct a safety frisk of him for potential weapons? I did. Can you describe for the jurors generally what the safety frisk is? Yep, it's a technique that we use to uh, ensure our safety, to make sure that somebody doesn't have a dangerous weapon uh, when we're going to transport or uh, speak with somebody. Does it basically just involve patting down their outer layer of clothes to make sure there's nothing there? That's correct. Did you find anything during your safety frisk of the defendant? I did. In, uh, in the defendant's right front pocket was a amount of cash and an e-cigarette. Okay. And with respect to that amount of cash, was that in a wallet? Uh, no, I don't believe it was. I believe it was just an amount of cash. And the jurors heard uh, a little earlier about, uh, and they saw some pictures of laying out cash, documenting it, photo photographing it. Uh, pursuant to a search warrant. Is that a process you did with respect to the cash on the defendant's person? It is not. Why not? 
Because at that point, uh, Tim Verrill was agreeing to speak with us. He was uh, free to go, and I had no reason to seize any of his property. Okay. And in fact, at that point, did you have a warrant to seize anything at all from the defendant? I did not. During that encounter where you found the cash in his pocket, did you observe any injuries to the defendant? I did. What were those? Um, I observed a, a large gouge on the back of his right index finger. Did the defendant also have a cell phone with him at that time? He did. So while still at that residence in Dover, did the defendant make some statements to you regarding his drug use? He did. What were those? Uh, he told me that he was trying to get himself back together and that he had been uh, using a lot of cocaine and other drugs. And later that same Monday, January 30th, did you have further interaction with the defendant? I did. And where was he when you interacted with him later that Monday? He was at his brother's house in Newton. What was the purpose of your interaction with the defendant at that time? Uh, at that point, uh, we were there to serve uh, search warrants obtained from the court. So in the interim between when you see him in the morning and then when you see him later in the day, some search warrants had been obtained? That's correct. What were those warrants for? Uh, they were for uh, his person and his belongings. And as part of the execution of that warrant, was his cell phone taken from him? It was. Was it your understanding the defendant had recently purchased that cell phone? That, that's correct. To your knowledge, have investigators ever recovered the cell phone the defendant had before he obtained that new phone? Not to my knowledge. So is that phone still missing? As far as I know, yes. Uh, how was that cell phone taken from the defendant on January 30th documented in terms of identifying it? Uh, it was given a, a unique evidence number. What was that? WMB1. And are WMB your initials? Yes. Was a body warrant also executed that Monday? Yes, it was. As part of the execution of the body warrant, did you observe any additional injuries other than the gouge to the right finger you just described? Yes, I did. What were those? Uh, there was a similar injury to the back of his right middle finger. There was a, a scratch or a cut on the front of his right index finger, and there were scratches on the inside of his forearm. Also, as a part of the execution of that body warrant, were major case prints and DNA samples taken from the defendant? Yes. Okay. How were the defendant's major case prints preserved? Uh, we entered them into a APHIS machine. Okay. And we talked a little bit about evidence numbers, but when major case prints are taken and put into the APHIS machine, do they need a unique identifying number? No, I believe they're identified by a name, date of birth, and other uh, identifying particulars about the, the subject. You also mentioned a DNA sample was taken. How was that taken? By way of buckle swabs. Do you recall, was it, or was it one swab or two swabs? Uh, two swabs. Do you recall the evidence number assigned to those buckle swabs? WMB8 and WMB9. And I want to go to a chart the jurors have already seen a couple times now, Exhibit 61, focusing on that top row uh, with the names and numbers underneath them. Do you see uh, Timothy Verrill WMB8 on the third column from the right? I do. When you executed that body warrant on the defendant on January 30th, had he been placed under arrest at that point? No. Moving to about a week after the execution of that body warrant on February 6th, did you arrest the defendant? I did. And where did you locate him to arrest him? He was at the Leahy Behavioral Health Clinic in Lawrence, Massachusetts. If I could have one moment, Judge. Yes. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I think what we'll do is take a short break and then we'll have cross-examination, okay? So we're going to break until 3 o'clock. We'll resume then. Thank you. Please rise.
Please rise, Jury Entry. Examination. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, um, you're currently head of the Criminal Investigative Bureau. The Investigative Services Bureau, that's correct. That includes overseeing the major crime unit? It does. That includes overseeing the drug and investigation unit? Yes. Some investigators, yes. As you said, fine, correct. Lots of different departments were involved in this investigation. That's correct. The major double homicide department. It was. <clears throat> yes. You reviewed your report. You were able to remember your involvement in it. Yes. It's a very serious case. To the best of my abilities, I've reviewed my reports, yes. And um, so, <coughs> you're aware, because you're now overseeing the major crimes unit, that there was a discovery violation during the first trial. Yes. And that discovery violation caused a mistrial. It did. And it was in part due to mismanagement of paperwork in the major crime unit. That's correct. All right, thank you. Is there any uh, redirect based on that? No, thank you. That's what it's going to be All right, sir, you may step down. You're excused. Thank you. Uh, state's next witness, please. State calls Timothy Burt. step into the box. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give to the jury will be the truth and the whole truth under the penalties of perjury? Yes, sir. Please be seated. <coughs> Good afternoon. If you could please just start by introducing yourself for the jury. Sure. My name is Lieutenant Timothy Burt. The last name is spelled B-U-R-T. What do you do? Sorry, I'm here. Sure. So you don't have to get too close to the microphone. It'll actually make more noise and make it worse. Uh, so that should be good. And just try to keep your voice up. OK. Is this better? Attorney Nye, is that okay. better? All right, thank you. Uh, what do you do for work? I currently am a uh, the crime, team, crime scene training specialist up at New Hampshire Police Standards and Training in Concord. Did you have any law enforcement experience before that position? Yes. Did you work for the Dover Police Department prior to that? Yes, I did. When did you work for the Dover Police Department? I worked for the Dover Police Department for about 23 years. I retired uh, the spring of 2022. Were you working for Dover in January of 2017? Yes. What was your rank? Detective. And specifically on January 30th of 2017, were you tasked with assisting in an investigation into a double homicide that had occurred in Farmington? Yes. 
Were some of your assignments to search both a Honda Civic and a Honda CRV? Yes. So let's talk about the search of the Honda Civic first. Where was that car when you searched it? Uh, the, the Honda Civic had been secured at the Dover Police Department. What legal authority did you have to search that Civic? I had a signed search warrant for that vehicle. Who was that Civic registered to? It was registered to uh, Crystal Felipe. And as part of your search of the Civic, did you take pictures? Yes, I did. I'm going to show you, uh, and it'll be on the screen in front of you as well, States Exhibit 70. Do you recognize these photos? Yes. Are those photos from your search of the Honda Civic? Yes. And do they fairly and accurately depict that car and some of its contents? Yes, they do. So I want to focus on the top right picture first. Does this picture accurately reflect what the license plate on that car looked like when you searched it? Yes. Was there anything noteworthy about that license plate? Yes. What? Uh, it did not belong to that vehicle. Did you ultimately find the license plates that did belong to that vehicle during your search? Yes. Where? Uh, they were located in the trunk of this vehicle. So now I'm going to blow up the bottom left picture that was on Exhibit 70. Can you tell us what we're looking at here? Uh, yes, that's a photo of the open trunk, and you can see the uh, license plates inside the trunk. And are those license plates the plates that actually belong to that car? Yes. Now I want to focus on the picture that was immediately to the right of that one. What are we looking at here? This was a Coles receipt that was found inside the vehicle. Is there a date and time stamp on that receipt? Yes. What is it? January 29th, 2017, 4.03 p.m. Is there also a location on that receipt? Yes. Where? It says Plastow, New Hampshire. So now I'm going to show you States Exhibit 7A and can you see the header on the top? Is there a date and time up there? Yes. What's that? It says Sunday, January 29th, 2017 at 4 o'clock p.m. Is that consistent with within a couple minutes of the Coles receipt that you found in that Civic? Yes. And I'm going to go back to Exhibit 70, focusing on the picture that is on the bottom right. What are we looking at there? Uh, that's a debit card uh, that was also found in the vehicle. Whose name is on that debit card? Timothy Verrill. When you searched the Honda Civic, did you also find a hat? Yes. Can you describe how that hat looked? It was a white ball cap. Uh, I don't recall it having any logos. It was kind of a blank uh, white ball cap with a mesh backing. Is this that hat? Yes. Did you also find a passport application in the car? Yes. Whose name was on the passport application? Timothy Verrill. So now let's move on to the search of the Honda CRV. Were you also assigned to search that vehicle? Yes, I was. Was that CRV also secured at the Dover Police Department when you searched it? Yes. And did you also have a search warrant to search that car? Yes, I did. Did you take photographs as you searched that CRV? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to start with Exhibit 71. Does this show some of the photographs you took during that search? Yes. And do those image, images generally reflect the condition of the exterior of the CRV when you searched it? Yes. So I want to focus on two of these in particular, but the first one is the photo on the bottom right. Does this picture accurately depict the license plate that was on the CRV when you searched it? Yes, it does. Anything unusual about this license plate? No. Did you also find a vehicle registration in the CRV? I did, yes. And was that the picture right next to the picture we're looking at now? Uh, on this picture, yes, that is correct, yes. So we'll focus on that one now. According to that vehicle registration, who owns the CRV? Timothy Verrill. 
Uh, now let's talk about some items you found inside the CRV. Did you find some bags from Red's Shoe Barn? Yes, I did. And generally, what was in those bags? Uh, there were a couple of pairs of shoes, a pair of socks, gloves, and a hat. Did you take pictures and document the items found in the Red's Shoe Barn bags? Yes. So now I'm going to go to exhibit 72. And if we look at the top two pictures of that exhibit, are those the items that were inside that bag? Uh, yes, there are two Red's bags. And those pictures depict both those as well as their contents. Okay. And what do we see up there? Uh, on the upper left, uh, you see a pair of socks, a pair of gloves, a pair of boots, uh, a hat, and a receipt. And on the upper right, there is a pair of sneakers. And you just mentioned there's a receipt on there. Is that the receipt that's pictured in the bottom left photograph on this exhibit? Yes. So let's focus on that for a moment. Is there a date and timestamp on that receipt? Yes, there is. What is that? January 28th, 2017 at 1522. And does it list a total cost of purchase? It does. What's that? $206.97. Does it say how that was paid? Yes. How? It says cash for the, to for the amount of $210. And could you just read for us the itemized list of things that were purchased on that receipt? Certainly. Uh, it says one men's. Uh, did you want the dollar amounts read as well? Is sure. Uh, for $99, one socks, $9.99, one men's. $59, one clothing, $9.99, one clothing, $28.99. And now I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 10A. And if you could look at the image on the bottom right, are you able to make out the date and timestamp on that photo? Yes. What's that? It says January 28th, 2017, 15, 24, and 35 seconds. Is that consistent uh, within a couple minutes of the date and time of the red shoe barn receipt you found in the CRV? Yes, it is. Was there also a target bag in the CRV? Yes. Okay, so let's go back to exhibit 72. The picture on the bottom right, is that a photo of the items that were in the target bag? Yes. And we'll blow that one up now. What do we see here? Uh, two shirts or sweatshirt type uh, clothing, as well as a flashlight. Did you also find a bottle of ammonia in the CRV? Yes. So let's look at exhibit 73 and the top left picture of this exhibit. Is that a picture of the bottle of ammonia you found in that car? Yes, it is. And I'm going to show you a larger version of this image. What size was this bottle of ammonia? Uh, two quarts, or 64 ounces. And did this bottle appear to have been opened? Yes, it did. Did you also find a container of Prestone driveway heat ice melter? Yes. And is this a picture of that container from Exhibit 73? Yes. Was it just one container of Prestone driveway heat you found in the CRV? Yes. Did you also find some solar salt in the CRV? Yes, I did. And is this a picture of that solar salt that you found in the car? It is. And were there two bags that you found? Yes. Were either of those bags opened? No. And now I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 8A. And again, can you read the header that's on top of that exhibit? Sure. The header says Lowe's, Rochester, New Hampshire, Friday, January 27th, 2017, at 2.30 p.m. And in the four pictures around the outside of that exhibit, do you see an individual with some items in a cart? Yes. So I want to focus you on the picture on the bottom right. In the front of that image, it appears there are two items that are white with black circles on top. Could those be consistent with the container of Prestone driveway heat that you found in the CRV? 
they do appear consistent with that container. But again, you only found one container of that in the CRV? That's correct. And then we see two larger bags in the cart. It looks like one's on top and one's underneath. Do those appear consistent with the two bags of solar salt you found in the CRV? It does appear consistent, yes. And then in the uh, same picture next to uh, the bag that's in the lower part of the cart, do you see what looks like a white and blue item there? Yes. And is that consistent with the bottle of ammonia that you found in the CRV? That does appear consistent. So we've talked about a few receipts already. Did you also find additional receipts in that car? I did. Did you retain those receipts as part of your search? Yes, I did. And when you retained those receipts, did you give them an evidence number? Yes. And I'm going to approach you now with States Exhibit 85. And I'm going to ask you uh, if your signature uh, and date are on. Yes. And does that envelope contain the receipts that you uh, found during your search of the CRV? Yes, it does. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to uh, pull those out of the envelope now, and then we're going to go through some of them. Is uh, one of the receipts in that envelope the Red's Shoe Barn receipt? Yes. And looking at that receipt that you have up there, is it the same receipt we were looking at earlier from the pictures on Exhibit 72? Yes, it is. Is there also a Walmart receipt in that envelope? Yes. And is that receipt in the same or substantially the same condition as when you seized it? Yes. So now I'm going to show you up on the screen, Exhibit 13A. Uh, can you read the header on top of that exhibit for us, please? The header says Walmart, Rochester, New Hampshire, Friday, January 27th, 2017, at 1.15 p.m. And in the top left picture, do you see two receipts there? Yes. Is one of those receipts the Walmart receipt that you have up there with you right now? I'm not able to read it on the screen, um, but generally it looks similar. So looking at the Walmart receipt you have up there with you, does it have a location on that receipt? Yes. What is that? 116 Farmington Road, Rochester, New Hampshire. And is there a date and timestamp on that receipt? Yes. What is that? Uh, January 27th, 2017. 13, 16 hours and four seconds. And are you able to read what items were purchased on that receipt? Yes. Can you tell us what those are? The first, the first description is partially faded, but it says ST45UN, it appears to be LT slash T slash D in the amount of $45. And the second item says E-911, then the word fee, in the amount of 75 cents. And towards the bottom of that receipt, is there a reference on there to a number of minutes? Yes. What does that say? It says 856 minutes. Uh, is there also a Lowe's receipt in that envelope, Exhibit 85? 
Yes, there is. And if you could take a look at that, we'll also go back to Exhibit 8A. Uh, is there a receipt pictured in the middle of that exhibit? Yeah, it appears to be that, that receipt, yes. Uh, is there something about the physical condition of that receipt you have up there that makes it hard to read? Yes. What's that? It's significantly wrinkled and faded in, in parts. Despite that, are you able to read the location where that receipt is from? Yes. Where is that? I'm just trying to make out the uh, numerical on the address. It's either 160 or 168. I believe it says 160 Washington Street, Rochester, New Hampshire. And are you able to see a date and time on that receipt at all? Yes. What are the those? Uh, January 27th, 2017, 14, 28 hours, zero seconds. Are you able to make out the purchases on that receipt at all? Mostly, yes. Can you read those for us? The first item appears to read 40 pounds solar salt Morton. And I can't quite make out the dollar amount. It, I think it says $11.30, but I'm not certain. What about the other items? The <laughs> second item says 64 ounce style selection CLR and I believe the dollar amount for that is a dollar fifty six one dollar fifty six cents and then the third item is very faded and wrinkled it appears to start with the letters P R S T N E And then appears to also contain the letters D R V W Y and then H T, I believe it says, in the amount of twelve dollars and ninety six cents. And on that last item, could those abbreviations be consistent with Prestone driveway heat? Yes. And you mentioned uh, the second item you said said uh, style selections on it? It does, yes. So if we go back and look at Exhibit 73, specifically the picture of the bottle of ammonia, you testified earlier this was 64 ounces? Yes. And can you see on the side here where it says style selections? Yes. Is there also um, a Papa Bear auto receipt in that envelope? Yes. And I'm going to show you Exhibit 73. Uh, is that the receipt that's also pictured on the bottom right of State's Exhibit 73? It appears to be, yes. And I will, I don't have an enlarged version of that, but does the receipt have a location on it? Yes, it does. Is there a date and time on that receipt? Yes. What is that? Uh, the date is January 28th, 2017, 4.37 p.m. Does it list a name under the customer information section? Yes, it does. What's that name? Tim Verrill. Can you uh, just list the services that were provided on that receipt? Certainly. There's a section that's labeled service checklist. And under that, it reads chassis lubrication, rear differential fluid, front differential fluid, transfer case fluid, transmission fluid, coolant, washer fluid, brake fluid, 
power steering fluid, battery fluid, tire pressure, air filter, cabin air filter, wiper blades, lights check, belts, wash exterior windows, vacuum interior, service review. And lastly, uh, did you find a set of Volvo keys in the CRV? Yes, I did. Where? Uh, those were located in the front driver door uh, pocket. Were either of the cars you were assigned to search a Volvo? No. If I could have one moment, Judge. Yes. That's all I have for you right now. Thank you. Cross-examination. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'm going to uh, start off with uh, asking you a question about the search of the Civic. May I approach? Yes, of course. I'm going to show you what's been marked as AD for ID. Can you um, take a look at that and see? Do you recognize what that is? Yes. What is it? Uh, this is a photograph of the interior of that Civic, uh, specifically the front passenger area. And is it a fair and accurate representation of what the front passenger area looked like when you opened the door for the first time? Uh, I'd have to review my entire photo series, but yes, generally it, that, that looks about right. Do you have uh, this mark as full as Civic? Did you say it was AG or AD? AG. AG for ID, and that's uh, ID stricken full exhibit. And that's the picture that you just looked at that we see on the screen? Yes, it is. Moving on to uh, your search of the Honda CRV. Um, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Defendant Exhibit U3. Is that an accurate description of um, what the interior of the car looked like of the CRV? Yes. This is the car that belonged to Timothy Barrow? Yes. And subsequently, you removed all the items. The evidence was sent off for processing. I removed items, and uh, certain items were transferred to the, the New Hampshire State Police. I'd also like to show you a picture of you, uh, B3. And is that one of the shirts that you uh, retrieved from the car? Yes. And that's a question about the ammonia that you uh, talked about earlier. You said it appeared to have been open. What determination did you make to make that conclusion? Uh, I had uh, opened the cap to see if it had been opened and the uh, safety seal on the inside uh, was not intact, so it appeared to have been opened. Okay, so, so you're saying that it was used? It was at least, it, yes, it appeared to have been used or open for sure, yes. Okay, but you can't tell if actually anything was empty from it, right? I could not tell. You, could, you didn't compare it to a new ammonia bottle to see if anything had been used? That's correct. Uh, one of the uh, tasks that 
you were assigned or that you took upon yourself was to search <coughs> that the search of both cars included the swabs of the seat belts and the seats? Yes. And the purpose of that is to collect any DNA or red blood that you couldn't see with a naked eye? Yes. And when you retrieved the, retrieved the key to the Volvo, did you examine it for any uh, apparent red blood stain? I don't recall. That may have a moment, Your Honor. Yeah. Review your report. Um, you prepared reports in connection with your search of the vehicles. Yes, I did. Did you review your report prior to testifying today? Yes, I did. Okay, so, if I showed your report, would that refresh your recollection of whether or not you took a close look at the key to determine whether or not there was blood on it? It would, yes. Yes. I'm going to direct your attention to the paragraph starting with Wednesday, February 1st, 2017. Could you read that to yourself um, and let me know when you're finished. Thank you. This does refresh my memory. Thank you. And what do you remember about whether or not you examined the keys for any stains? Yeah, I did not see any visual stains on it. And did you um, forward those keys on to the state police? Yes. Thank you. Any uh, redirect? No. Yeah, All right, sir. You may step down. Thank, Thank you, Your Honor. You. Your Honor, should I do something with this? Uh, you can just leave it right there. They'll take care of it. Thank you. Thank you. And then see counsel at the bench. The next bit of evidence will take about 45 minutes with some setup, uh, setup time in addition. We're going to go ahead and suspend for today. Uh, start tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Try to be here shortly before 10 so we can start on time. Thank you. Please and rise. Please leave your notebooks behind.
about scheduling? Yes, yeah, so as we noted at the bench, we anticipate that the state's case will end on Thursday, likely Thursday afternoon. Uh, with respect to the schedule tomorrow, we have to put uh, Mr. McMahon on in the morning because he's unavailable on Thursday, so okay. we need to make sure we get him done. Uh, and that's why we call him in the morning. But the afternoon, we want to put on Mr. Clough's testimony. That will last two hours and four minutes. So that's something that we have to do in the afternoon because our morning session is not long enough. Ms. Polonzi's deposition is 45 minutes. What we'd like to do is put on Mr. McMahon, and we also have Trooper Hildreth, who is about a half an hour witness. So we're hoping that we can finish McMahon and Hildreth in the morning, and then put on those recorded uh, testimonies in the afternoon. So again, Polonzi is 45 minutes because it's recorded. And Clough is two hours and four minutes. So that's a total of two hours and 50 minutes. And we also have a break that we have. Mm -hmm. So it's cutting it pretty close, but we wanted to let you know that yeah. if we can put those on in the afternoon, we certainly would like to do that, but we will be stretched a little bit for time. All right. Well, I think if we, um, depending on how the morning goes, how long do you expect Kevin McMahon would be? 45 minutes an hour. But on direct? Do you know how long your cross of Kevin McMahon is? And that being said, if, if uh, McMahon is long, we'll just put Gildred on to the first because that's something that we do. Well, I was just thinking if we, if we got them both in roughly by noon to 1215, we could take a short lunch. And that way we can get the two recorded testimonies done in the afternoon with a short break in between. Um, the Clough testimony, that's going to be read, isn't it, by a witness, or is that? That was the one that defense counsel wanted an uh, audio recording, so we did have it is an audio recording. Is that so no, it's two hours and five okay. minutes long. There, right. will be a, there will need to be a brief uh, court instruction because there's obvious redactions in that audio portion. Yeah. Is that just uh, his uh, testimony from the first trial, and it's been redacted? Okay. All right, and I will give an instruction on that. Um, do you want an instruction also briefly on, pardon if I don't say her last name correctly, Polonzi, that it's? No, because that's part of the recording I say if you want to say what she's doing. All right, but I also wanted to let the jury know for both of those recorded testimonies, they are ID exhibits. The testimony itself is what they're to be paying attention to. I want to make sure that they're aware of that so that they don't think they're going to get those audio recordings in the jury room with them. Okay, so I do intend to spend 30 seconds explaining that. All right? Um, just, a, just while I'm thinking about it, with respect to the statements I want um, the defense is seeking, the statement of Stephen Clark that we're seeking to admit, the one regarding seeing the keys and the other one regarding the bag and paper. I was going to try to... Um, I'd like to be able to read from the transcript with one of them as, uh, just adding on at the end. Because yep. it would be part of his cross. I mean, okay. my intent was to be part of his cross. Right. You don't have an objection to that? I thought you were simply going to put on, a, I think the trooper's name was Sloper, who took part of that statement. I don't know what the other one was. but uh, yeah. So you're not going to call a witness uh, yeah. to do that? Uh, yeah. You're just going to read it? When I think about it, I think it makes more sense to put it in as part of the cross. Right. Since there's no objection, we'll do it that way. Okay. All right. Great, thank you, see you tomorrow.